Sonic Levels. Who doesn't love a good Sonic stage? What the hell is this? Sonic Levels are usually one of, if not the most important thing in every Sonic game, meticulously crafted to elevate your experience to new heights. They're as diverse as they are fun mostly, and are an integral part of the Sonic franchise. Even though they are really diverse, they share a lot of similarities on how they are built and with what purpose they are built across every single title. And and today, that's what you're gonna be looking at. I'm gonna be looking at each mainline Sonic game's levels and then analyzing their design, philosophy and purpose and tying them with other games, their gameplay and other sort of influences. What classifies as a mainline Sonic game though is not always certain, so my criteria are that it needs to have been released on a home console, is not a spin-off, is not Shadow the Hedgehog and I'm also pretending that Sonic 4 doesn't exist. This time around I'm gonna focus on covering the games by eras which I came up with to describe similar philosophies, being the classic era, the adventure era and the boost era. The games that belong to each era are not necessarily released one after another, so it should make things a little bit more interesting. The video will probably be massive, so I recommend watching each era individually as if they were different videos, so it doesn't get very tiring for you. I also won't cover every single boss or every playstyle that is not Sonic's for all all games, but I'll cover the most notable ones. I also want to stress that I'm not a game dev nor am I experienced in designing levels, so always take my analysis with a grain of salt. I'll try to be as objective and impartial as I can, but my opinion will always be a big influence in the analysis. At the end of the day, you just have to remember that my opinion doesn't really matter. It's about time someone does a retrospective on this, isn't it? Beginning with the classic era, we start in 1991 with Sonic 1. Seeing Mario's success and fearing being left behind, Sega had to act quick and come up with something that could rival Nintendo's main selling franchise. This something grew up to be Sonic, as we all know, which would prove itself to be one of Sega's best and smartest creations. What appealed to most people was the speed, the color, the difficulty, basically its style and its gameplay, which really stood out in the scene at the time and the levels and their design are what make that orchestrate so well. Levels in Sonic 1 had to be memorable and fun, so that the game and character could make an impact on everyone who played it and keep them coming back for more and more. Sonic 1's level design, although very solid, is still very bare-bones compared to what we'll see in the future. This is due to hardware limitations, of course, but there's also the fact that there weren't any references to go by of bigger and better level design. Sonic 1 pioneered what were speedy and fun levels, which would be perfected time and time again as the years went by and also influenced other games to adopt the same philosophies. They feel good, they look good, they sound good, they're fun to play, they're fun to explore and they're fun to master. There's still a lot to improve on, which is mostly dictated by Sonic's moveset and how the game works generally, such as Sonic's lack of a spin dash, which at the time didn't make any difference because it didn't exist yet, but in hindsight it's probably the biggest reason that makes Sonic one distinct from its successors and on the negative side. The fact that there's a third act per level is also a big miss in my opinion, as it feels like it's too much, but once again there were no references or opinions to go by. Lots of bottomless pits and weird mechanics are present here which would be discarded as time went on, but for how this game is, how the mix of speed, platforming and puzzling is handled, it all works very well. There really wasn't anything like Sonic 1 before which helped it stand out more and leave a mark on the people who played it. The level settings are really diverse and are no doubt very iconic. I'm going to cover each level in this game but I can't promise I'll do it for every other game, as it's more important here to establish what the basis for the levels are so I can cover the other games more generally. Green Hill would be a level staple in basically every Sonic game from then on, if not in name then in spirit. It's a very welcoming level with its green lush look and sunny disposition. It's a great introduction to the core mechanics of the game, not being overly difficult but not overly easy for new players. It focuses on speed primarily while also incentivizing exploration with a lot of hidden items and multiple routes to discover and blitz through.
Marble Zone is the platforming and puzzling stage of the game. It's a slow level and requires you to be even more concentrated in the game in order to not die, as there are a lot of traps here and a lack of checkpoints as well. It's an introduction to these slower aspects of the game, which I'm not a big fan of, but it does its job well enough. It combines the themes of ancient ruins, caves and lava, which is well suited for a level that focuses on slowing down for some reason, careful exploration and using your brain a little more. A classic, but it really isn't what you expect from Sonic games nowadays, is it? Spring Yard is the casino level of the game. As we'll see in a bit, this theme won't go away, ever. It's really hard to describe levels like this, as they're a beast of their own. It's packed with bumpers, springs and secret areas within the walls. It's another slower level and one that focuses on the exploration aspect and lets the player get a hang of how the physics interact with the objects, the level design, Sonic and the environment itself. In my perspective, it's a level that prepares you for what's coming. It's a colorful level based on an urban area, and the song just helps convey that atmosphere even more. I would say that this is the level that perfects the slower aspect of the game. It's not a rage level, it can be annoying at times, but not overly so, and it can be fun when you get the hang of it. And that's what it strives to do, make you get the hang of it, of the physics and use the environment to your advantage. Labyrinth Zone is an important stage, no doubt, as it embodies perfectly what shouldn't be done in a level. It's the water level of the game and much like Marble Zone, it's based on ancient ruins and a sort of cave, but this time underwater. This level is supposed to introduce the player to the water system of the game, but I'm sure there was a better way of doing it. It's a really slow level, as you would expect, and it's not fun, at all. To stay alive underwater, you must pick up air bubbles that appear at set points in the stage. The problem is that Sonic drowns pretty fast and there aren't many air bubble generators around. This is especially a problem when there are a billion enemies and traps that you can prepare for that stall your progress more and more. It doesn't even feel good to finish it, you're just glad that it's over and that's when you know something's wrong. In short, don't overextend water levels, don't place a thousand hidden traps, especially in a water level, and please get it out of my sight. Starlight is like going to heaven from hell. It takes place in a rather peaceful urban environment at night, under the stars while playing a very relaxing song. This level reintroduces the speed aspect of the game, with many downhills, loops and open roads for the player to speed through. To raise the difficulty of the stage, the devs removed every single checkpoint, with only one post being present this time around, right before the boss in Act 3. This stage introduces some new mechanics that are fun, like the bombs you have to launch in these seesaws which will fall on the other end so as to launch you upwards. It also has some bottomless pits, but they are pretty easy to avoid. This level is probably the one with the most alternative routes, as the dropping staircases make way for new paths to be accessed. There aren't many enemies here, there are literally only two types of enemies, which conveys this relaxed atmosphere even better. It's the sequel to Green Hill Zone that was missing in this game, and it's very welcome. Scrap Rain is the final level of the game, and it's based on an industrial setting, that is, until you get to Act 3, where you go to Labyrinth Zone again. This is supposed to be the hardest level of the game, filled with deadly traps and machinery, such as trap floors, flame vents, electrical conductors, disappearing and rotating platforms, and more. Act 1 starts outside, where you can see grimy, depressing towers expel smoke into the sky in the background. Act 2 takes you inside the fortress itself, where spinning flywheels and conveyor belts will carry Sonic along, and buzz saws and swinging spike balls will make things all the more dangerous for him. Act 3 is basically Labyrinth Zone again, what a nightmare, since, according to Yuji Naka, they wanted to make the player drop down a level to create the feeling that the player needed to fight their way back up, and in retrospective it works well I guess. Although a slower level, it's a level that tests everything you have learned up until this point point rather than focusing on exploration, and in my opinion it's done quite well. And to close Sonic 1 off, I want to quickly mention the special stages, which are definitely special. If they wanted to make an impact with them, they definitely did, as they're really weird but also good in a way. Challenging enough and pretty fun at times, but also very frustrating. 
So yeah, I guess that's about it for Sonic 1. It established core concepts for the franchise both in gameplay and level design, and would be the cornerstone of improvement for the next titles. Which brings us to Sonic 2. With a better understanding of the capabilities that the Mega Drive had, the developers made sure to use them almost to their full potential. This was reflected on the better graphics, soundtrack and gameplay, but also on the levels, which are hugely helped by the graphics and gameplay anyways, as new techniques made for a better and more detailed art style, which would in turn enable the developers to create new and outstanding environments. Sonic's moveset has also been refined, and now includes the Spin Dash, being an almost instant burst of speed that allows the player to traverse the stages even faster than what was possible in its predecessor, which means that the stages now have to accommodate that factor. Also, there are now only two acts, thank god, aside from the last three stages, although the stages are longer now to compensate for that. With that said, the levels are mainly designed with speed in mind this time around, while a lot of levels in Sonic 1 actually focused on platforming, exploration and puzzling, although Sonic 2 still has those elements, they have been somewhat reduced compared to its predecessor. Levels like Chemical Plant and Mystic Cave, although being some of the levels with the most platforming, are still mainly built with speed in mind. The latter may be less, but you get what I mean. This, as I've said, is mainly because of the spin dash, since if Sonic 2 had Sonic 1's level design, this new ability would have probably been useless most of the time, as there weren't many elements elements in the first title that could take advantage of it. Most of the level themes are also similar to Sonic 1's. There's the lush starting level, the water level, the ancient ruins level, the casino level, which is much eviler here, the cave level, the industrial level, but there are also some welcome surprises and innovations. Emerald Hill is basically just Green Hill again, which doesn't take its credits and virtues away. Much like Green Hill, it's still a great stage for introduction, especially designed for the player to experiment with the spin dash and get used to the new additions in the level design. Chemical Plant and Casino Night are your staple levels, with tons of routes to explore, tons of loops and downhills and some engaging and fun platforming. Also, notable here is the introduction of elements usually seen in pinball tables, which would later influence some of the worst levels to ever be created. Aquatic Ruin and Oil Ocean are your exploration levels, where the bottom path will be full of enemies, obstacles and traps which will make for slower games gameplay, while going through the higher path will reward the player with less enemies and a faster route. I know I've referenced this quote-unquote pathing system a few times now, but we'll analyze it a bit further in a bit. Mystic Cave and Hilltop are your platforming levels, where going through the high or low path doesn't mean much, as the alternate routes have not been fleshed out to the extent of other stages, and are more focused in precise jumps and careful progression than anything else. Metropolis, Sky Chase and Wing Fortress are your final levels, where you're tested to the max and are required to concentrate in order to progress without dying, being the hardest levels in the game, as is to be expected. Sonic 2 manages to improve significantly on the level design compared to Sonic 1 where it lacked, especially in platforming. Platforming in Sonic 1 was really slow and really brought down the rhythm of the game. Sonic 2 still has a ton of platforming, as is to be expected from a 2D platformer, but unlike Sonic 1, it's quicker this time. Sonic is able to go faster now because of his new abilities and the addition of longer paths for the player to run on, in turn making jumps, falls and rolls help the player build speed and momentum, rather than slowing them down while still being fairly accurate. Even in stages that are really cramped and claustrophobic, like Mystic Cave and Hilltop, you're able to go pretty fast if you time your jumps right, which was still possible in Sonic 1 but not as accessible or fun to do, thus rewarding the player for mastering the physics and the level layouts. As I've said multiple times by now, going through the highest path both in Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 would grant a faster route to the finish, but it's even bigger of a reward in this one, not only due to the paths themselves being more elaborated and having more thought put behind them, but the game also introduces tales, incentivizing the player to use them to reach the top paths, which is a nice touch. Though to be honest, no one really uses him for this. Realistically, the concept of a high path, a quote-unquote ever 
average path and a low path is substantially different in Sonic 2 than it was in Sonic 1, especially because this concept isn't so black and white anymore. Sonic 1 is different from Sonic 2, 3 and CD in that there are more direct paths, rather than routes that branch out, switch and converge like in its successors. This concept still kinda exists in Sonic 1, although it only starts becoming evident around Starlight. Sonic 2's level design is mainly composed of 4 to 5 paths, the main path being the route where most people go through. At some point in the stage, its status of main path starts to get more blurred as it will start mixing with the lower and higher paths and will eventually lead to the same place, with the only difference being how fast you do it. The low path where less experienced players will find themselves most of the time. The traps are more evident and the difficulty is higher than in the routes above. The high path where the player can find themselves by exploring and finding hidden passages and combining multiple aspects of Sonic and Tails' moveset, being rewarded with less enemies and more speed. And lastly, the quote unquote branches that lead way to and connect to higher or lower routes, basically being mini paths. Notice that, even while trying to give definitions and classifying certain paths as high, low or main routes, it's still a very flexible concept, much like the routes themselves. There's a lot of freedom for the player to explore, and the levels really make use of several roads that are constantly intersecting and converging and joining together. This is, in my opinion, where Sonic 1 lacked. This new system of paths and routes makes the player even more intrigued in actually exploring the levels, mastering the the fastest routes, as they now can be accessed taking advantage of the spin dash, making for some pretty satisfying moments, and rethinking how to approach certain obstacles and enemies. Do I kill this enemy to access the top path, or do I skip it entirely to access it later on? These decisions could still have been taken in Sonic 1, sure, but they are so much more meaningful now, seeing as there's a lot more to explore and at stake as well. And it would only get better with Sonic 3. Sonic 3 expands a lot on the groundwork that Sonic 2 set up, so much that it eliminates some of it in the process. Gimmicks are now much more abundant than they were in Sonic 2, and the level design is pretty much twice as large as it was there. After Sonic 1 and 2, Sonic Team knew that they could take this franchise very, very far. So far, in fact, that they wanted to make a game even greater than what the first two establishments could ever achieve, which would later become Sonic 3 and and Sonic and Knuckles. This title is so ambitious that they couldn't fit both games on a single cartridge, and had to rely on the new lock-on technology Sega had developed, which is, as always, reflected on everything seen in the game. Gameplay, soundtrack, story, and notably, style and level design. The art style of the levels and the game itself is even more detailed than what was seen in Sonic 2. The stages are crafted with a lot of care and attention, having a lot of scenery which which makes use of new and better techniques for the textures to simulate lighting, depth and distance. There are still some franchise staples here, like the lush starting level in the form of Angel Island, introducing the player to the already established moves, including the spin dash, but also making way for new moves, being the insta shield and the new shield items, with each shield being present and having sections where each one can shine. The mandatory water stage being Hydro City, Hydrocity, which is actually quite fun this time around, with some challenging segments, great and engaging platforming and a lot of downhills and loops, and the mandatory casino stage, featuring a lot of gimmicks that allow you to traverse the stage in a billion different manners, being focused on precise and tight platforming and also in making your life hell. But there are a lot of new stage themes and settings that make the game truly feel greater both in size and in quality and more unique than ever. As I've said before, Sonic 3 expands on what Sonic 2 has achieved compared to Sonic 1, and what's different is usually better made or thought out, while some elements that were present in the previous game's level design were omitted, some for the best, some for the worst, but it comes down to personal preference. Specifically, do you remember how I talked about high paths, low paths, main paths, branching paths and stuff like that? Well, since the levels in Sonic 3 are much bigger than those in Sonic 2 
and Sonic 1, the definition of this is even more blurred now. Instead, as the levels are massive, each path has the opportunity to be bigger and more extensive, containing many individual and unique areas that would be able to integrate a single Sonic 2 stage each. As a result, routes are much less linear now, as opposed to Sonic 1 and Sonic 2, where you would usually only go from left to right, Sonic 3 embraces going up, down, left, right and all around. Just when you think that you're making some good progress and are about to reach the end of the level, a curveball is thrown right at you and now you're going left at the speed of sound and twisting and turning and landing on platforms that were 1 km above you just 5 seconds ago. Each route individually, as opposed to the previous two games, doesn't really vary much in difficulty nor do they vary much in how fast you finish the stage. This adds to Sonic 3's gameplay in that it makes the levels not only feel much bigger, which they are for a fact anyways, but it makes the levels feel richer and more alive, with each path being abundant in gameplay value and never failing to throw the player a seamless mix of speed and platforming. Sonic 3 also marks the first time that characters have their own unique abilities. Sonic has the Insta Shield which allows him to deflect projectiles and dodge damage, and the powers of the Elemental Shields which let him dash forward, double jump and bounce, while still having the abilities from the previous games. That is excluding CD, which is being analyzed next, even though it was released before Sonic 3. Tails can fly and swim, and Knuckles can glide and climb walls. We take this for granted nowadays, but in hindsight it's possible to see how massive of a change this makes in level design. How much their respective abilities influence it though is up to you. While in some stages Sonic and Knuckles have their main path that branches out through multiple sections, Tails on the other hand has a shortcut that only he can access. This is a perfect example of how clever level design doesn't have to be complex. More often than not, the little things are the ones that make the biggest difference. Building stages around the character abilities would be a concept that wouldn't be abandoned for some time, which is a positive thing as it helps the stage feel much more unique and organic. Although it takes a lot of work as you're basically creating multiple levels at once and have to think of implementing it in a way that feels natural and especially fun. In my opinion, this is done to almost perfection in Sonic 3, and it comes down to a few reasons. First, gimmicks are not overloaded. It's very much welcome to have some moments which rely on stage or character specific gimmicks, but when a whole level relies on that, that's when it gets ruined, especially if the gimmick isn't that good to begin with. Sonic 3 basically never overdoes gimmicks, with a few exceptions. There are still a lot of them, but they are fun and engaging enough to not overwhelm the player, once again with a few exceptions. And it's a welcome change to the quote unquote default Sonic gameplay, if you know what I mean. Secondly, subtle use of paths. As you may come to realize while playing Sonic 3, character-specific routes are not always obvious. They require the player to play the stage, usually as Sonic as he doesn't have many specific routes, find out that there's a new route somewhere that Sonic can't reach, and then play that part of the stage either as Tails or Knuckles depending on which one can access it. Sometimes characters are forced to remain or go to a different path by clever designing of the character's abilities. For example, in Angel Island Act 2, if Knuckles tries to go to Sonic's route, he'll climb up this rock and end up smashing it. Since Knuckles' jump height isn't as high as Sonic's, he can't really go to Sonic's route and is then forced to continue on his new path instead. All of this while still feeling natural. Thirdly and lastly, not letting rules be broken. This means that, if a path is only supposed to be accessed by a specific character, only that character can access it and the others can't go there by any means, outside of hacking and glitching of course, thus not killing the purpose of the routes. Also, I really like the bonus and special stages. They are pretty clever and go much further than Sonic 1's and Sonic 2's did, though they can get boring at times. All of the changes seen here make for the game we know today. A fun, polished to some degree, engaging platformer that flows better than any other up until this point, much due to its clever level design and attention to detail that you would expect from a game that wanted to improve on an already pretty good base. And to complicate things further, let's get into Sonic CD. 
Sonic CD was released between Sonic 2 and Sonic 3, this meaning that it already takes into account the improvements made in Sonic 2 while also smoothing out some edges and issues, rolling out a red carpet for the implementation of Sonic 3's ideas. If you have ever played this game before, you know that when it comes to level design, it isn't as simple as it was in the previous three games I covered. If you haven't, you may find yourself asking why, and ironically, the answer is pretty simple. CD introduces a new gimmick that would only be present in this game, time travel, being one of the essential elements of the CD experience. For the first two zones in each stage, four different time periods can be visited, the present, the past and two different futures, being the good and the bad. Always starting in the present time zone, you can make Sonic jump between the past and the future by running across time warp plates, adorned with the word past or future. Each of the four potential time periods one can jump to feature completely new art reflecting where Sonic is, with subtle changes in the layout. What may work as a quick way to blast through a zone in the present may be entirely impossible to get through in the past, and vice versa. These changes in level design reflect on the way the levels are built in Sonic CD, for while you can storm through a level for the fastest time possible, the multi-layer design can force you to explore everything within, not just for secret rooms and item boxes, but for items that can change the way a level works, specifically the robot transporters. Located somewhere in each version of the past for the first two zones of any given stage is something known as the Robot Transporter. Though they can be found in the present and bad future, they are nothing more than broken machines that have already done their job, thus making Sonic unable to interact with them. In the past, however, the machine is still fully functioning, and if Sonic is able to locate and destroy it, the badniks within the zone will cease to exist, immediately breaking apart and letting the seeds go free free, planting flowers that adorn Sonic's path through the level. It is only by destroying this machine that a good future can be obtained in the zone, a cheery, pastel version as opposed to the dark and bleak mechanical form that composes the bad future, which only appears if the player ignores the transporter. Basically, every stage has two acts with every act having four different layouts. They are all very different in how they look and their differences are still pretty significant, meaning that every warp plate has to be placed in such a way that, when the player manages to warp in time, they don't get stuck, which is still possible to do, though it doesn't happen very often. This quote-unquote factor has to be thought cleverly enough to feel different between all four versions, which is also aided by how the levels look in each time, we'll take a look into that in a bit. If you look at each stage carefully, you'll see that the past versions of every stage usually, and I'm not sure if this is actually a rule of thumb, feature simpler segments and routes compared to the other versions of the stage, probably meant to represent the lack of Eggman's intervention. Sonic CD is the perfect example of how a specific gimmick completely changes how stages are thought out. What you think you knew about level design? Forget about it. Well, it's not that drastic, but you get what I mean. Sonic CD's level design isn't much like what we are used to seeing when it comes to Sonic stages. It's much more about exploration. Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 had some exploration elements, but not to the degree of CD, with the only game similar to it to this day being Colors, though less extreme. You can play the game like you would the previous two, sure, but that won't give you the true ending of the game. The way the game is quote unquote supposed to be played, take this with a grain of salt as you play a game however the fuck you want, focuses on exploration rather than blasting through the stage and trying to get the best possible time. It's about finding those warp plates, destroying the transporter and creating a good future. The levels in this game, much like Sonic 3, are already sort of giving up the idea of low and high paths as separate concepts. Take a look at Collision Chaos's Act 1 present, for example. It may feel like the higher path is faster. <laughs> because it is. But the difference here is that it doesn't matter. The focus of the level design isn't to make you go as fast as possible. It's about building a challenging environment that feels big and fun to explore, while providing a great mix of platforming and speed, which would be the basis for the philosophy seen in Sonic 3. The difference being that in CD the stages are much more focused on exploration, thus also differing from Sonic 1 and Sonic 2, and that's also why it only served as a basis for Sonic 3 and is not 
with sexual philosophy. As for level themes, we start with a usual lush starting level, being Palm Tree Panic. There are many palm trees around, along with star-shaped plants and fallen logs. Peaceful waterfalls plunge into an idyllic blue lake in the background. This stage, and most of them actually, still feature what you would expect in a Sonic level, such as loops and vertical ramps, along with a very large loop that Sonic runs through at the beginning of Act 1. Interestingly, the small platforms act differently based on the time zone. In the present, they will not appear until the player steps on them. In the past, they are always visible. And in the future, they fall out as soon as the player lands on them, selling the idea that the environment is rotten. Next is the mandatory casino level, Collision Chaos. Collision Chaos is the type of level only a pinball fanatic would love, with neon signs depicting gibberish typefaces flickering all over the place. It has bumpers, fields full of springs, pinball flippers and spiked little ball chains that populate the short corridors found at the bottom of the stage. It's not a difficult stage, just usually an annoying one, as most casino stages are anyways. Tidal Tempest is the mandatory water level, sort of resembling Labyrinth Zone, but less terrible. Each time zone has its own square block shape, and several blocks are grouped together in many clusters to form varying shapes or larger blocks that move in different patterns, though some can also crush you. Buttons are placed in a variety of places and have many functions, such as opening up walls to reveal hidden rooms and passages. I would say that the stages after these present mostly new themes, Themes, though there are some that still quote-unquote recycle themes, like Stardust Speedway being in an urban area, though it's very distinct anyways. Quartz Squadron is also a welcome surprise, and Wacky Workbench and Metallic Madness are very challenging levels as you would expect from industrial levels. On the topic of Stardust Speedway, it's the staple level of this game. As I've said, it's based on an urban setting, being a very psychedelic stage consisting of many twisting highways decorated with musical instruments and flashing spotlights in the night sky, making for Sonic CD's largest stage by far. Many of these highways are littered with springs and speed boosters that instantly propel Sonic to top speed, sending him both on his way and in the opposite direction. It's the stage that resembles more or the type of feeling you get in a stage like Chemical Plant, for example, and thus generally being the most loved stage in this game. People don't really enjoy Sonic CD's style much, usually with the argument that it isn't what Sonic is about, but I have to disagree. Sonic is not all about speed. I think people forget that when negatively talking about Sonic CD's level design, for it too open, too confusing or too slow, you have to take into account what its purpose is and what it's trying to achieve. If you go into CD expecting the same you did from Sonic 2, then you'll be disappointed. If you are open-minded enough though, I think you'll come to appreciate it. I'm not saying you're obliged to appreciate whatever it is, but just take into account that CD isn't Sonic 2, nor does it try to. It's a Sonic game, first and foremost, no doubt, but it focuses heavily on the exploration aspect and platforming rather than full-out speed and loops and downhills or whatever, and its uniqueness is exactly what makes it special. If you don't like Sonic Sonic CD, try to see it with other eyes, for I think its levels are very cleverly designed, tying up with the universe, the gimmicks and the story nicely. And to finish CD off, I want to quickly shout out the special stages, which are the first fully pseudo 3D special stages. I know that Sonic CD had a sort of 3D special stage, but it was very limited. Also, a cool detail in Metallic Madness is that while in the present and bad future you're inside a factory, in the past the factory is still under construction and in the good future it has been destroyed. So yeah, before we move on to Mania, let's do a little retrospective on the evolution we saw between the release of Sonic 1 and Sonic 3. Sonic 1 introduces the basis of what would be the philosophy of the level design in the series. Loops, downhills, fast platforming and a very rudimentary system of paths, all laid out for improvement. And improvement would be laid out as Sonic 2 expands on what it needed to. There are more routes to take, more paths to explore, less puzzling 
styling, more detailed settings and a level design that could take advantage of Sonic's moveset, blending the speed and platforming aspect of the game nicely. Sonic CD is the middle ground between Sonic 2 and Sonic 3. It experiments with its own gimmicks, focusing heavily on mixing the exploration aspect with fast platforming and decision making, carrying the title of a sort of outsider when it comes to how the levels are built, being more open and much bigger than normal. Returning to normality, Sonic 3 improves further on Sonic 2's work and takes some notes from Sonic CD, thus resulting in bigger levels, even more detailed settings, an even more complex system of routes, diverse and fun gimmicks and a sense of uniqueness unprecedented by any game before it. The best way to look back and take conclusions on how level design and the actual games evolved over this era is to play them. I could sit here and overanalyze every single detail but I really won't. It's pretty obvious to see the differences by just looking at the games. My words couldn't do a better job than your eyes, could they? And what better game to represent exactly that feeling? It's Sonic Mania. Respectfully jumping 23 years into the future, Sonic Mania is a return to the style of the Mega Drive games and features both brand new zones as well as reimagined zones from Sonic 1, Sonic 2, CD and Sonic 3. A game that was developed by fans of the franchise who have done extensive work on fan games, they all felt basically the same way as others did about the level design of the classics. And if that wasn't enough, they perfected it. Truly. I have basically no criticism regarding Mania's level design. Not negative anyways, though that isn't the main point of the video. The stages still feature old elements as you would expect, such as rings, badniks, item boxes, loops, downhills, multiple paths and routes, what made the classics great. What they failed on is exactly what isn't present here. It hits a perfect balance of speedy spectacle set pieces with slower platforming challenges in every single stage, which is something the classics lacked for the most part, consistency. While in the classics you would play a very good stage, it would have probably been followed by a mess stage, then another good stage, then a less so one. Here that's completely gone for the most part. You're treated with banger after banger after banger and it just feels nice having this kind of good consistency in a Sonic game. The remix stages, some of which were quite daunting in their original form, have been redesigned in such a way that makes their previously daunting elements fun and adds new stuff like slopes and loops to create new fast segments. The new stages are pretty damn good as well, masterfully crafted to elevate the experience to unprecedented heights, featuring very fun gimmicks and platforming, interesting and creative paths which feel more alive than ever, consisting in a generally perfect gameplay experience overall, helped immensely by the introduction of the drop dash, which is an ability that you'll really miss when you go back to the classics. Every playthrough you do in this game won't ever be the same. There are so many options in every stage, so many routes you can take, which follow the same philosophy as Sonic 3 for the most part, that the game almost never feels the same in my opinion. All of this praise also goes for Tails' and Knuckles' story, as well as the Encore mode, which are all masterfully crafted and lovingly made, and it shows I don't even have to argue about it. The problems that they had in the classics, like their abilities not being utilized to the max, a slower gameplay, which is still sort of present, though the level design helps immensely immensely in mitigating this, are all practically fixed or smartly made use of, as well as a known story that makes them feel as important as Sonic does. Stages look better than ever as well, with the old themes being mostly intact in Act 1 while being completely redesigned and changed for Act 2, keeping the experience fresh and the levels engaging, introducing completely new gimmicks and mechanics specific to this game. It's really hard to say more about it, honestly. It takes huge emphasis on exploration like in CD, while still managing to include the speed Sonic is known for. Alternate paths and exploration are organically integrated into the levels to a degree that the classics could never achieve, and in my opinion it's about as good as classic Sonic gets. I really doubt that classic Sonic can ever flow better, feel smoother, more organic and better crafted than in Mania. I'm sorry that I'm dedicating so little 
little time to it, but I really don't have more to say without dragging this on and on and repeating myself multiple times. All I can say is that it's probably the perfect way to close out an era. It's still all fun and games when it's easy to identify how and why these games have evolved, and how much they have evolved, because that concept will only get more and more corrupted as we move to 3D, starting with Sonic 3D Blast in the Adventure era. I know it's weird to cover Sonic 3D Blast in the adventure era as it doesn't really fit, but I want to cover it briefly as an introduction to why things are the way they are in adventure. Sonic 3D Blast, or Sonic 3D Flickus' Island for my fellow Europeans, was a game released for the Mega Drive and Saturn, and I just want you to take a look at this. I could end this segment here and you would understand everything I'd say in SA1. I'm exaggerating. Sonic 3D Blast is confusing. Sonic's main objective throughout the game is basically always the same. Collect the Flickies so Sonic can reach the end of the level. Destroying the Badniks is the only way to free them, where you have to then run into them to make them follow you and make them go through a dimension ring. Seems and is simple enough. I did an injustice at the start though, its level design isn't that bad, it's just different. A common misconception that people tend to have with 3D Blast and other Sonic spin-offs in general is that because it's a Sonic game, it must be a speedy, fast-paced roller coaster ride, and any deviation from that means that it must be a bad Sonic game. Despite the question of whether the series should be defined by speed alone, 3D Blast is clearly not trying to be that. It's a slower, exploration-driven game based around collecting and retaining flickies, and a game that should be mostly judged on its own merits, not entirely by comparison. You might not like it, which is your right, I don't really enjoy it as much as other Sonic games either, Either, but that's fine, because we are here to talk about level design, aren't we? So, as I've said, 3D Blast focuses on exploration, thus being a slower game, and the reason that its level design looks really weird when zoomed out compared to the classic titles is because of its camera. One of the integral pieces of the 3D Blast experience is its isometric camera that gives an illusion that you're actually in a 3D space when you're not. As a result, creating levels that work well with the system is not a cakewalk, but but it's done quite well here for what is possible. There are a few routes that offer a couple of different ways to finding each badnik, and you are also rewarded with rings, shields, special stage access and lives if you explore enough to find the many secret areas hidden about. And those power-ups will become important in helping you get through a variety of challenging sections and gimmicks. This isn't to say that the level design is perfect, however. The placement of the levels in terms of difficulty feels a bit too inconsistent with Diamond Dust Zone being much easier than the two zones that preceded it, then being followed by the frustrating Volcano Valley Zone. As the game reaches to a close, the stages become more and more linear, which makes the second half of the game quite a grind as you're encouraged to start rushing towards the end. And that was the biggest problem with 3D Blast. It wasn't really 3D, it really wasn't what Sonic fans expected at the time, it was a tiring experience, and, above all, it wasn't up to standard with the classic not even when judging it for its own qualities. And so, for the next title, which would be fully 3D, Sonic Team, Sega and the fans wanted new, better and more impressive than ever, which could only be achieved with some pretty damn good level design. And so, Sonic Adventure was born. If Sega was going to catapult Sonic back into the mainstream after a poor showing on the Saturn, Sonic Adventure would have to tear the world apart. And it did, didn't it? With endless possibilities at the disposal of the developers compared to what was possible in previous consoles, Sonic Adventure would need to have it all. Good gameplay, good story, good graphics, good soundtrack and especially good levels. Even though 3D Blast had the name, it didn't quite have the three dimensions, meaning that 
that Sonic Team didn't really have much experience at building a 3D level outside of maybe Sonic R and Knights, which isn't really 3D anyways, meaning Sonic Team had to nail the level design on basically their first ever try. This can seem like an extremely daunting task, as the team had to combine speed, fun platforming and gimmicks and make the stages embody Sonic's essence in a playstyle that they weren't familiar with at all. And even though they had little to no experience in crafting 3D levels, or 3D games for that matter, they had a better experience at crafting 2D levels than most. So, as a result, Sonic Team tried to replicate the 2D levels and gameplay into 3D, which definitely took a lot of trial and error, but in the end, it paid off massively. But there still are some noticeable differences between the two iterations. The 2D levels focused heavily on momentum to build up speed, a concept which is still controversial to this day. Momentum, as a scientific definition, is the product of the mass and the velocity of an object. Translated to Sonic, it means that the characters pick up more and more speed the more time they spend rolling on a downhill, for example, and carry that speed onto other segments of the level. In 3D, this isn't as important as there are a lot more factors to take into consideration, which is a little bit hard to explain, but you just need to understand that to make the physics the same as they were in the classics, the levels had to be really large, which the hardware didn't really allow, especially taking into consideration that the levels are already pretty massive in the final. This doesn't mean that momentum is completely gone, it just means that it doesn't play that big of a role anymore, but you can still see it and feel it in action most of the time. Another reason, and probably the biggest, for the levels being the way they are is the Spin Dash. The Spin Dash is single-handedly the most important piece of Sonic's moveset, even more so than in the classics. Sure, Adventure introduces a bunch of new important moves, such as the Homing Attack, Jump Dash and the Lightspeed Dash, but refining an oldie can make it as important or even more impactful than the new moves you introduce. While in the classics you could use the Spin Dash to build up speed to clear a loop, which would in turn build a lot of speed into a downhill which would make you roll at the speed of sound before going up a slope and reaching the topmost path of the stage, now you use it in the opposite way. When you see a slope in Sonic Adventure, you can spin dash into it, which will give you a lot of potential to jump onto higher platforms or skip entire pieces of the level geometry, as they are usually bent inside out now. It doesn't even have to be slopes. If you're good enough, your spin dash can propel you much further than a normal jump dash, allowing you to reach certain parts of the level geometry which may seem inaccessible at first, but actually contain items, meaning that the developers intended that the spin dash should be used that way. While in the classics the top path would grant a faster route and the low path would grant a slower route, in this game that concept is basically scrapped entirely in favor of an overhauled system. You get faster or slower routes depending on a few things. First, utilizing the spin dash. As I've said, you can perform a lot of skips with it, meaning that you will have a faster time in a stage if you perform a lot of skips than if you can't, rewarding the player for replaying the game and mastering the level layout. And secondly, utilizing the objects. As I say objects, you can refer to them as gimmicks, it's the same thing most of the time. For example, in Red Mountain Act 1, the rocket that propels you upwards leaves you with two choices. One, do I land on a safer path where I will most certainly not die but will have a slower time by the end? Or two, do I land on this harder to land spring and skip a good portion of the level at the risk of falling down? Things like this are what make each level unique and adds that pinch of difficulty and freedom that's needed in the game. And this is only referring to Sonic's levels, since there are a lot more characters that you can play as in this game that have their own unique abilities. Some levels for some characters may be mostly identical to Sonic's level or to some other character's level, but these stages are so well crafted that even with little to no changes they can almost fulfill every character's potential, almost being the keyword. I would say that most of the 
fun in this game comes from using the level design to your advantage. Some characters can't really take advantage of this, sure, but the stages are built in such a way that if you use your abilities correctly and perform some sick skip or whatever, it makes you feel really cool and that's when you know it's been done right. There's probably a lot more to say about it, considering the new ideas and mechanics implemented, but to be honest, SE1 is a lot like the classics but in 3D, and some of the stuff introduced here is done better justice if covered in SE2. As for stage themes, they look good, I guess? For the hardware, they look incredible, it's just that it looks dated, as is to be expected. It doesn't really happen much with the classics, sure they are outdated too, but it's a type of art that remains pretty similar to this day, especially considering how great it looked for a hardware like the Mega Drive, while 3D has evolved a lot. In this game, a lot of tricks are used to simulate a better looking environment, especially on the water, but considering what it is, and especially compared to its sport, it's done nicely. The game still has the sunny, though this time less lush starting level, which introduces Sonic's abilities, the second stage which really brings out these abilities to their full potential, the mandatory casino stage, the Eggman base stage, etc. But 3D, GD-ROMs and the new, more powerful hardware allow the developers to craft completely original and more thought out and detailed levels than ever, and for a first time they managed to create something very good in my opinion. What's more to say, I love this game's level design honestly, it already sets the bar pretty high for any game that's coming after it. There's a lot to improve, sure, but if the standard isn't brought down and the level design keeps being consistent, then we're set for success, and the standard wouldn't be brought down, as Sonic Adventure 2 would be knocking. SA2 is to SA1 what Sonic 2 is to Sonic 1. A sequel that improves, polishes and reinforces the concepts that were introduced in its prequel while keeping its core gameplay basically untouched. Or is it? SA2 is as different to Sonic 1 as it is similar, perhaps more different than similar at times. When you think about it, it might not seem that way, since both fall under what we usually call the adventure and gameplay level design, but when you really start analyzing stuff, they are vastly different. But let's get into its similarities first. First of all, core gameplay is mostly the same, although with some quality of life improvements, like the addition of the bound jump, the somersault and some other cool abilities. As a result, stages are now built with these moves in mind as well, having small passages where you have to use the somersault in order to go through, and some higher paths that you can access by using the bound jump, which may contain some items or offer a completely different experience. The light speed dash doesn't have to be charged anymore, making for even faster gameplay and platforming than before, thus being used more frequently compared to SA1. Sonic can now grind on rails as well like in Jet Set Radio, allowing new stages to be built that revolve around this mechanic or make heavy use of it, also being used as a faster route towards the finish, rewarding the player for managing to land on the rails, which are sometimes placed in some pretty tough spots to reach, and also rewards the player for mastering this mechanic with really quick movement, as the balancing mechanic is pretty tough to get right and you need it to get speed on this. What applies for Sonic mostly applies for Shadow as well, as their stages are pretty similar in how they are designed because they have pretty much the same moveset and core gameplay. Some new gimmicks are also introduced, like gravity switches and Knuckles being able to access different rooms by digging, which help the stages feel even more unique and fleshed out helped by their very distinct distinct art style, which is still sort of realistic but a little bit more cartoony compared to SA1. The core gameplay of the characters and the philosophy of the level design is mostly the same as it was in the prequel, except for Tails and Eggman, which now control mechs and feature in arcade shooter stages. Even though the philosophy is mostly untouched, the way the levels are built, it probably isn't what you would expect from a sequel to a game like SA1. A sequel, when it comes to video games, usually means that it will employ many improvements compared to its first installment, take those designs it put forth and refine them greatly. As I've said before, a perfect example of this can be found in this very franchise, from Sonic 1 to Sonic 2. I'm not saying SA2 is not a true sequel to SA1, but it 
it does spin that concept entirely. The reason for it is that the level design here is much more linear compared to SA1, which took a more open level approach, with big hub worlds in between to connect the story and levels. SA2 gets rid of that entirely, streamlining the story progression and puts the player back in action as soon as possible. Stages are a little bit smaller and, once again, more linear, which doesn't essentially mean it's a bad thing. This is due to multiple reasons which we'll get into very briefly. People usually mix the concepts of bad and linear for some reason, which is not always the case. For some people this is an improvement, for others it's a step back, which doesn't make the concepts equal. The stages in SA2 are still pretty well crafted, and I would go as far to say that City Escape is probably one of, if not the level with the best level design to this day. There are multiple videos on YouTube that overanalyze this level specifically and why it is incredible, so I'm not going to do it. If you have played it and liked it, you'll understand. As opposed to SA1, each character has completely unique and specific levels to themselves, which is a side effect of the smaller levels, allowing them to be crafted completely revolving around those characters' abilities, making for some memorable and honestly great levels, some of which are still pretty damn open even if most aren't. If they are fun or not is up for you to judge, I guess, as some really are pace breakers and could have probably been executed better, especially Aquatic Mine. The water mechanic doesn't really work well with the claustrophobic level design, though it's probably the best way they could have implemented it. The problem is that water levels in this franchise are terrible intrinsically, not gonna lie. The way the levels flow is smoother and makes a little bit more sense in my opinion, because as great as I think SA1's level design is, it's a little mindless at times, especially when it comes to platforming and exploring. Well, not exactly mindless, maybe just too ambitious for its own good. SA2 actually manages to refine that, with almost everything in the levels making perfect sense, keyword being almost, and with platforming and decision making playing a bigger part now. And this goes for all characters by the way with treasure hunting levels being really open and focused on exploration, the hedgehog levels perfectly mixing speed and platforming, and the mech levels taking inspiration from more arcadey shooters, thus containing some puzzling elements as well. As I've referenced, SA1 had really big levels, so they could almost harness each character's abilities to their fullest without big changes in level design and object layout. The reason that the levels don't follow the same pattern in SA2 is probably because they weren't developed by the same team who developed SA1. You see, SA1 was developed in Japan, while SA2 was developed in the USA, hence the existence of City Escape and Radical Highway. This means that a group of people who created and established the idea seen in the first title weren't working on this new game, or the majority of it anyways, so what could be done to improve on those concepts they created isn't really on their hands, so an almost completely new team couldn't really improve on something they themselves were not familiar with or didn't really know much about. And that's why the levels are designed the way they are, probably. A more arcadey spin on the SA1 formula, with more action, more speed, especially more spectacle and a slightly different art style, which were all more familiar to the Western audience. On the topic of art style, and before we actually get into stage themes, one aspect where I think SA2 solos SA1 is on style. For some reason, I always love doing the somersault then jumping in this game and seeing Sonic performed that animation. The level design helps this immensely by introducing gimmicks that focus on this aspect, like the jumps at the end of the rails, the big falls, the loops, camera transitions, the spectacle overall. It just makes playing levels even more fun than they already are in my opinion. SA1 already did this to some degree, but SA2 really takes it up a notch. And as I've said with SA1, if something makes you feel really cool when you're playing, then something is being done right. As for the level theme, Teams, they look fine, I guess? They suffer from the same problems as SA1 did. This game definitely makes better use of the hardware than the prequel, though some issues can't be remedied entirely. I think it looks as good as SA1 did, though I prefer SA1's style more. SA2 does manage to fit in more detail and the graphics are technically generally more impressive, as the devs have a better understanding of the Dreamcast now and can now harness its true potential. Still looks as dated as SA1 did. Thank you.
Welcome surprises are that this game's levels don't really follow any old themes, such as the sunny lush level, the casino level or the mandatory water level. Ok, the latter is still present but it's a knuckle stage, so it's different. Each story has an atmosphere pattern though. Hero stages usually feel and are sunnier and more vibrant, as opposed to the dark stages which are usually set in grimmer and darker places, though the level themes mix for both in the latter stages. So yeah, what is there to say? SA2's levels are quite different from SA1's, as you could see, but are still really, really good in my opinion. It takes a less open approach, but manages to cram more stuff without overwhelming the player and truly improves in what it kept from SA1 and delivers on what it tried of new. Its level design philosophy, or the core of it, being the less open and more linear stages, are concepts that are present in basically every single Sonic game after it, as evidenced by Sonic Heroes. This will pain me a lot, as Sonic Heroes is my favorite game of all time, and as far as I remember, the first game that I have ever played in my life, and I have a lot of criticism ready for it. Sonic Heroes is the first mainline Sonic game to have been released for a non-Sega home console, meaning that this game also had to appeal to non-Sega gamers in order to survive on the new industry. It's also of note that this one was released for the next generation of consoles compared to SA1 and SA2. Too, meaning that the hardware is now more powerful, thus new possibilities emerge. Sonic Heroes' level design is... odd. Oddly good in my opinion, but also very flawed. The core principles of its level design are allowing moments of divergence and convergence based on the currently active character. While each character on the player's team has individual speed, power and flight abilities, the level design smartly creates points where the player can choose to approach a given subsection of the level with two to three different primary routes based on those abilities, being the divergent paths, with later sections bringing the player back onto a set path that requires each of the character's specific abilities to complete a single given section where no choice of path is available, where the paths all converge. No specific path or route is usually better or faster than the other, some might be slightly easier though, which still makes for some bits of diversity. As I've said, each team is composed of a speed, power and flight character. As opposed to any other game, instead of controlling one character at a time, you're controlling three, so it's expected that each one brings something to the table. The speed character runs faster, can use some variation of the tornado jump, can scale poles, use the homing attack, perform a rocket excel and also triangle jump. The new abilities introduced here make for new options in the level design as is to be expected since scaling poles create new opportunities to send the player vertically more often. The rocket excel helps the player gain enough speed to jump over bigger gaps and climb slopes faster, and the triangle jump can be used to avoid slower routes by jumping from wall to wall. Talking about skips, the spin dash has been nerfed here compared to the adventures, which is sad. The power characters are the fighting force of the team, having very powerful attacks, being able to destroy certain enemies that the other types can't, making for the possibility of having rooms full of enemies that the player can just melt through, focusing on the combat aspect of the game. They also have the ability to break through doors and push large objects, creating new puzzling and exploration segments, as well as using the triangle dive which is frequently used in combination with fans, once again allowing for more vertical movement. Lastly, the fly character can fly, obviously, and is mostly used to carry the team over by bottomless pits or reach some higher areas, allowing for different paths that lead you to harder to reach collectibles and even more vertical movement. Or if you're boring, you can use it to destroy every single boss that spawns waves of badniks with a thunder shoot, which is their main attack, making flying badniks fall and stuns them temporarily, or at level 3 you can just destroy them instantly. Firstly, I want to touch on what I think this game does right in terms of level design, and then focus on what it does wrong. 
For starters, I think that the idea of swapping characters on the go is a really smart one. In paper, but I'll get into that in a bit. It does help each level feel unique to some degree, as it has its own gimmicks and its own style of completion, which work with each character's abilities differently in basically every single level, adding some salt to the experience. The level design almost solely revolves around this, as it's a pretty big part of the experience and is really hard to avoid. Secondly, I think the stages feel great to play. I know the main point of criticism surrounding heroes is its controls and how they are slippery and... Shit? I don't really agree, as I've got used to them so they don't bother me anymore, but I do understand why it would bother you though. But once you get the hang of them, I don't think there's much to hate about. The characters don't exactly flow smoothly like clockwork through the stages, especially when there are a lot of segments that are usually either pretty hard or slightly annoying for how the characters play. But when you can pull a perfect runoff, it's almost as if the game is perfect. Thirdly, the gimmicks. I think that the gimmicks are really fun, except for the casino ones, but we don't talk about them. The poles, the flowers, the vines, the frogs, the energy roads, they are really fun and make for some great set pieces when they work correctly. They usually mix very well with the theme of the stage, which just makes them feel more organic and like they actually belong there. There is an argument to be had about some of them only existing for certain characters to have more of a purpose, which I do agree that it's sometimes feels that way. Lastly, the spectacle. Like SA2, this game also focuses a lot on spectacle. There is the small kind which is usually accompanied by small camera changes, dialogue or just the way the stage is presented, and then there is the climax of the stage which is usually always present at the end of Act 2, usually being a chase sequence that requires quick thinking and decision making. And all of this brings me to the negatives. It's pretty tough to say that I'm more easily find negative stuff to say about a game than positive. I guess it's just easier to express negative feelings about something you love but know it's really flawed. Imagine you're a big McDonald's fan. You love McDonald's burgers. Why? Because they taste good, they're cheap, and what else? They are really bad for your health, they are not very nutritious, and they are not even that good of a quality for price product. And that's what Sonic Heroes is. Bad for my health, not very nutritious, and not very great quality quality for money, probably, but it tastes very good. That comparison was silly, but I guess it gets my point across. Even the good things I say about it have flaws intrinsically, starting by the use of the character switching mechanic. To be completely honest, there is no real part of the levels where you feel this mechanic is used to its full potential. It feels uninspired, if you get what I mean. You're using the speed character, then you switch to the flight character to pull a lever that's located high up, then use the power character to break a glass to progress to the next segment of of the stage. It's usually fine, and in some parts it's actually very good, where it can be used smartly to traverse through some sections. For example, you have to go through a section that is mostly built for Sonic, but you think it's too risky, then switch to Tails, as his controls are slower and more precise, thus making the section easier. But most of the time, this mechanic just ends up being really bland and boring. Other Sonic games also have weird mechanics sometimes, but the levels there usually allow them to be used to their full potential, even if their full potential is shit, while in Heroes this mechanic still leaves a lot to be desired. It's not like you're given more actual options by having this mechanic. Sure, you have specific paths you can take, but it's not enough, I feel like. You can do pretty much the same that the fly and power characters can do as a speed character, especially when referring to Sonic and Shadow, and that's when you know something's not right. Next, and usually the biggest criticism, how it plays for all four teams. This game features four different campaigns that are supposed to bring freshness and new gameplay styles into the mix, but they usually only end up being a nuisance and artificially extend the game. While stages usually play well for Team Sonic, which is the normal difficulty of the game, with pretty much the same number of enemies, rings, checkpoints, etc. that you would expect, and also for Team Dark, which is the hard difficulty of the game, featuring 
bring more enemies, less rings, less checkpoints and sometimes completely new segments of the level. The same can't really be said about Team Rose and Team Chaotix. This is due to most people starting the game by Team Sonic, then Team Dark, followed by Team Rose and then Team Chaotix. By the time you get to the last two teams, you're already sick and tired of the game, of the same stages, of the same experience. Sure, the level design and object layouts are slightly different between campaigns, and each team sort of has a different objective per stage, but it's basically the same thing, over and over again. The only team that switches this up is Team Chaotix, and most of its missions are either really annoying or really easy, and even then they are not really fun. These levels are really only designed to be played once or twice at max with the changes seen in Team Dark's layouts. Playing every single stage four times is too much, not taking into account when you need to replay a stage just to get into the special stage and don't even get me started on those. There are a lot more nitpicks I could have with it, but I think it isn't worth it. I've been at it for too long and the main problems are pretty evident. Lack of polish, lack of testing and lack of manpower mostly. If you didn't know, according to Takashi Izuka, Sonic Heroes' levels were solely designed by him and by another member of Sonic Team, which would end up sick. That ultimately caused Izuka to work constantly, never sleeping and ending up losing 22 pounds. Even with that, they still crafted, in my opinion, one of the best levels in the entire franchise, which is Eggfleet. <laughs> Where do I even start? This level is what the entire game should have been. You start in one of the many ships belonging to Eggman's fleet. You're supposed to work your way between this massive agglomerate of ships in the sky, blowing them up in the process, watching your steps so you don't fall to your death and avoiding cannons that are constantly shooting at you. It's a really open level with tons and tons of paths to take, where the gimmicks are smartly placed, the level is well paced, the character switching actually makes sense being almost mandatory and in a good way to progress. The flow is great, the combat is actually engaging for once, and the scenery and spectacle are just incredible. The build-up cutscene for it just makes it all the more impactful. <laughs> Alright Eggman, let's get this party started. On the topic of scenery, how do the stages look? Incredible, all of them. As this game is now on even more powerful consoles than the Dreamcast, it's expected that this game would look better than SA1 and SA2, even when given the fact that the PS2 version is graphically less impressive than the other releases, it still looks fantastic. The scenery is great, the level themes are achieved superbly, and the colors are really vibrant and transmit a really good feeling. The actual graphics and lighting are really great and the water specifically is handled very well. If there's somewhere this game does not lack, it's atmosphere. So yeah, with all of my criticism, it doesn't even look like this game is my favorite game of all time, does it? I still love it and will continue to do so, but its flaws are too big to ignore just because I like the game. Though acknowledging that a game is flawed and loving it is not an oxymoron. Level design is sometimes messy, mechanics are not implemented to their fullest potential, but there is still a lot of stuff that's really, really good in this game and there are lessons to be taken from here. What should be done when you have a lot of mechanics and characters to handle, what shouldn't, and specifically, how do you improve on this? How do you prevent these errors? Knowing that the game coming up is Sonic 06, you would expect things to go even more downhill, but do they?
I'll get it out of the way, Sonic 06 is a mess. A fun mess, not gonna lie, but a mess nonetheless. Lots of glitches, weird mechanics, weird story, weird progression, very weird overall. Given this, you'd expect that the levels would contribute greatly to this. What if I tell you that the level design, along with the soundtrack, is one of the few redeemable things in this game? The level design here is supposed to be the sequel to SA1's level design that SA2 really wasn't. It's more open, with many of the design philosophies used then being present, aside from the use of the spin dash as its success here. Though it is inspired in SA1's, it doesn't mean that it's actually as good as it was there. I do want to stress that at this point in time, there really isn't a distinction in 3D Sonic's gameplay style, since today we know these games as the adventure gameplay games. Sonic just always played like that, with some variation in gimmicks and whatnot. Just keep in mind that, when I say it is sort of a sequel to SA1, it doesn't mean that the previous games didn't feature basically the same design philosophy. Anyways, some stuff was definitely improved, here you have more paths to take for example, with this system being surprisingly deep, and I'll analyze it in a bit. But there's definitely a lot that was also downgraded, mostly because of time constraints. An example of this is the fact that the stages feel really dead and empty sometimes. Even though the stages in SA1 were really open, there were not many areas where nothing was going on. The stages were like a living organism, with everything doing its part in order to keep it alive. The same can't really be said for 06, as the level design is also open, maybe even more than SA1's, but there are a lot of areas where there is nothing going on, to the point that you don't even know if you're going the right way. Other heavy influence in 06's level design is the combat. Well, similar to the speed character's combat that is, mostly consisting in just pressing the A button multiple times to kill enemies, though you can use some new moves here, like the slide or kick and the bound jump which makes a return. The sections which specifically exist for combat, spawning multiple waves of enemies and whatnot are usually the worst, as the combat isn't very deep or fun at all, and also really slows down the gameplay for something that's just not worth it. This becomes an even bigger issue for Shadow, as his combat is even worse than Sonic's even though his combat is more fleshed out. And Silver's I don't really mind honestly, it's a cool car concept, but I'll get into those two in a bit. As for paths, as I've said, the system is surprisingly well made and thought out. Sure, there are some stages where this is very uninspired or non-existent and feels like it belongs in a completely different game, but for the most part it's really good. Use Sonic's Kingdom Valley as an example. After that wind grind section you go into the segment where the bridge crumbles. Here you are presented with two options. Going to the right, where you'll take an easier path, though a very long one, where you go through complete different places and jump from platform to platform to reach the eagle. Or go to the left, where you're also presented with two options. Go left, dash through these rings, bounce up, where you can either go to the next rope or pick up the item box and go to the spring. Then, when you land on the platform, you can either climb this wall by destroying these two enemies, get a one-up and go through the rainbow ring to skip the bridge. Or you can also just go through the bridge by foot, making your way through this wall where you can either go up to get to the next wind grinding section faster or go down for a slightly harder sequence but ending up directly on the eagle platform. Or, going back down, you can go forwards, climb the wall, which is really hard because yeah, the game is unpolished, and end up at the exact same spot where you can take the same decisions. I think this has been really well done for a game like 06. Hell, even if the game was given more time and was more polished, this would have already been good. Though it could have and would have probably been better if that was the case. Gimmicks are usually simpler and kind of fun, though a lot of them are just okay, some are really boring like the lights in Flame Core, and some are especially terrible like the floating orbs in Aquatic Base, making combat and traversing almost impossible. Some are actually built with the new Havoc physics in mind, like crumbling platforms that then make rocks fall in your direction which you have to avoid. It's nothing special, but it's neat I guess, though some don't 
work very well. Another gimmick is the character switching, such as Sonic and Silver in Kingdom Valley, Shadow and Rouge in Flame Core, or Silver and Blaze in Crisis City. This is usually hit or miss, because most of the time the secondary character's controls are really buggy, and their sections are mostly uninspired. I do like the Blaze sections both in Crisis City and Wave Ocean, however, but it's mostly due to her gameplay being fun and the level design being good, as it's mostly the same as Sonic's stages. But yeah, most of the time this gimmick just ends up stalling the momentum and rhythm of the game, which is not fun most times. For Sonic level specifics, I have to say that the max speed sections are possibly the worst sections of any level in the entire franchise. Most of this is due to the terrible, terrible controls crafted for this, but the level design doesn't help either, as it just doesn't work with these controls, as they usually require precise quick jumps and fast reactions that are impossible to perform. The spectacle here is cool I guess, but it's overshined by the horribleness of everything else. They just feel like they exist for the sake of existing, for artificially extending already pretty long stages. Another thing that doesn't work very well with the level design are the gems. This is either due to their system being really really buggy, or the fact that it just doesn't make much sense to be able to use them sometimes, or at all really. Some gems are so glitchy in fact, that you can literally skip the entire level without giving it a thought. Again, if the game had enough time to be developed, maybe this would have worked really well with the levels, and we would have some sections or paths of the stages which would take advantage of them, but that's just not the case here and so it's a big miss in my opinion. For shadow level specifics, the level design is frequently more open than Sonic's, or at least seems that way, but I'm not gonna lie, it's really really confusing. The new vehicle gimmicks for him don't help either, as most of them are focused towards exploration and such, but there is nothing in the levels that's worth exploring, as once again they are really big but are really empty. The vehicles are not fun either, they control like shit, and they're there just to differentiate Shadow's gameplay from Sonic's, but it just ends up doing him dirty. Again, Shadow is more focused on combat and platforming, so there are a lot more sections of both, contrary to Sonic which was more of a mix of both and speed. The combat specifically is worse than Sonic's in my opinion, it's more complex and deeper though it's really slow. There are a lot of sections where multi multiple waves of enemies spawn and you just have to repeat them over and over again. Using the chaos boost does help in this regard, where the combat is much faster and you can teleport to enemies, which is actually a really cool mechanic as the level design actually takes advantage of this, where there is a row of enemies you have to kill to climb up something, and you can do it really fast when using this ability. As for silver level specifics, his gameplay is interesting. I know that most people don't enjoy it, but I really don't mind it. There's a lot of room for improvement though, like making him a little bit faster and his abilities flow better and being less buggy maybe, as well as making the stages smaller as they feel too big for how slow he moves. His puzzling sections are definitely the worst part of his level design, especially the ball puzzle in Dusty Desert, to the point where most people just use glitches to skip those sections entirely, and that's when you know something is wrong. Some are are cool, though they are more gimmicks than puzzles, like the skills in Radical Train where you have to place boxes on top of them to go up. On the same topic, his platforming is okay I guess, it's tolerable, though there are no memorable sections, and those that exist are usually because of his telekinesis gimmick, where he uses them in set points on the ground that makes new platforms appear and such. On the same note, this mechanic is usually the main point of his gameplay. It can be used, as I've said, on the ground to make platforms appear, to bounce you up like a slingshot, or as his main combat ability, where you have to improvise weapons with Rights, thorn balls, shovels and other shit on the ground, which is a really cool concept, not gonna lie. This is not all fun and games, as sometimes the telekinesis isn't used very well. Sometimes you gotta use it to break doors by throwing objects at them repeatedly, for the sake of variety, but it doesn't really add anything. A dishonorable mention goes for the logs in Tropical Jungle, where most times you can't even see what you're doing as the gimmick really fucks the camera up. 
In general, the levels in this game are one of the few things that make this game fun, as most times the level design works really well with the controls. Sonic 06 is the title that wanted to carry out what was seen in SA1 while mixing it with elements seen in SA2 and Heroes, but its ideas end up falling short sometimes, even though the levels flow well, play well and are challenging enough to keep you engaged most of the time. The atmosphere is really good, I like the art style, though sometimes they have dull colors and, once again, are really empty. The spectacle is also great most times, adding that grandiose element that was sometimes missing from other games. Graphics are also better as well as lighting, though it has a lot of problems, taking advantage of the more powerful hardware to also implement more complex particle effects, but there's still a lot of improvement to be made. And improvement would be made with Sonic Unleashed. But we won't get into that just yet, as next will be Sonic Lost World. I know that it feels weird to include Lost World here, but realistically, there is nowhere else where it would have made sense to put it. Sonic Lost World was released in the middle of the Boost era, which is coming up next, and so it's kind of a try to bring Sonic to his adventure gameplay style while also changing things up. And things up they changed, for the worse mostly. For starters, Sonic has a lot of new abilities here, like the wall run and climb, the spin dash, which is back for the first time in like 7 years at this point, which has been tweaked to include this spin dash chain where you keep your spin dash when you jump. These work well with the level design, introducing a new parkour element to the stages, while also taking some inspiration from adventures platforming, except when it doesn't. A big problem here are springs. Most attempts at some sort of parkour or running are usually ruined by a random ass spring that bounces you all around, which isn't very fun. They should be used to explore expand the level layout, not carry Sonic through the level with no interaction from the player other than accidentally hitting it. Addressing the elephant in the room, the actual level design. Stages are usually built around a type of cylinder shape, whereas you rotate along it, they turn into completely different sections, much like different paths, or work as an entire section that goes all around the island. It's weird, and gravity is played with a lot in these levels, but I think it works okay and adds some flavor. Some levels are more open so this isn't very noticeable or just don't use it at all. But it's a somewhat fun spin on the level design considering that it's not very offensive. And yes, I know it looks a lot like Mario Galaxy. Wisps can also be used to get to new paths or places in the stage like in colors. But we're not there yet. Revealing hidden areas of the stage or entirely skipping a section of the level. Contributing to both the exploration and speedrunning aspects. Gimmicks are usually just just okay, with most being a hit or miss, like that ugly purple fish in Tropical Coast, being really slow and just not fun at all, with some being neat, like the clouds or ice controls for example. Another element introduced in the stages are the giant springs and cannons, which are used to connect the multiple islands seen in the stage. They are just okay? They suffer from the same issue as the usual random springs, where they are just a cutscene in the middle of the level, it adds a little bit of spectacle which is good, but these sections should be more engaging in my opinion. Obstacles are surprisingly creative, though not very challenging, and are usually present in specific platforms dedicated to mini puzzles, which are really easy to clear. They are definitely one of the sections of all time, they are not memorable at all. They exist for the sake of trying to add some difficulty, but don't really manage it very well. The gameplay is generally slower here, as Sonic's speed is nerfed to help in platforming and exploration, also adding a double jump that replaces the jump dash. As a result, levels have a lot of platforms to jump on, which let you climb walls or other platforms, also featuring some sections where you can run on walls or also perform a quick sequence of tricks, which feels good though not always fun. There is a lot of automation here, which at first isn't all that noticeable, but you'll end up realizing 
realizing that most things you're doing are scripted events. The most common problems here are the springs, as I've said before, and also the dash panels, which are mostly used to correct the player's direction, which I'm not a fan of. The more you get into Sonic Lost World's gameplay and level design, it becomes more evident how sort of uninspired it is. It's still fun in my opinion, but it signals several larger problems within the franchise. It tries to appeal to a younger audience, which isn't a problem. The problem is that they wanted to change things enough to make it feel different and easier, but didn't quite get rid of the automation that's been present for some years at this point, for the sake of making the game quote-unquote easier and more accessible. I haven't talked about the boost games, which are the guiltiest of this, but since this was released on the midst of that era, you'll understand what I'm saying in a bit. It looks like a Sonic game, but it doesn't really feel like one. It has its own qualities, which deserve to be talked about, but its flaws also do, and that's the biggest problem with Lost World. It's uninspired. The gameplay looks fluid when you watch it, but when you play it, it doesn't feel like it. Sonic doesn't accelerate properly and feels stiff. He doesn't always maintain speed while sparkoring and platforming, which is a concept that the classics and adventure games did carry out, becoming especially bad when considering how similar its gameplay is supposed to be to those. Sonic isn't all about speed, I'd say it's more about acceleration. Maybe a run button is a smart idea for a platformer, but it doesn't fit Sonic at all. This isn't as important in the boost games for several reasons which we'll get into, but for a game that's slower like Lost World, and especially for a Sonic game, the fact that there are only three movement modes which don't feel remotely good to control, that's a problem. If it's good or not that Sonic has an instant burst of speed is reserved to each's opinions though. Even then, it's not very well executed here, as the level design doesn't really take advantage of it positively. This becomes more evident when you realize that there's a dash panel before every single loop, because Sonic just never accelerates properly for this burst of speed to be remotely useful. I mean, acceleration and momentum are something that was done right in the first level of the first ever Sonic game. There is no excuse for being this bad in any level here. I never said that anything about this game was better than good, and even then it's more like okay. The more you look at it, the more you realize how uninspired the levels and gimmicks are as well. One of the best things about this game though are the real levels, as Tropical Coast Zone 3 and Lava Mountain Zone 2 are really good levels. Sonic feels good to control, it introduces some acceleration, some difficulty, and the platforming feels really, really fluid. It's said that the levels that are entirely based on rail platforming are the best ones, but yeah, they have something nice going for them. But yeah, generally the level design suits the controls, and the game isn't all that terrible, it's just mediocre mostly. It's uninspired, and has a lot of problems that could have been easily fixed, which is mostly caused by the mentality of who develops these games, and also by the ones who consume them. There isn't much spectacle, though the one that's present is fine, the levels look good, and the atmosphere suits them well, even though some of them are pretty uninspired. And with all of that, what have we learned about the Adventure Era's level design? Firstly, we have to look into what separates this level design from the classics. The classics were mostly built around momentum and acceleration, and the Adventure games, and basically all modern Sonic games really, are mostly built around speed. There is still some momentum and acceleration in these games, though it doesn't play that big of a role because of the way the environments are built and Sonic's new abilities, which usually compensate for this alteration in physics. Some games completely break this philosophy, like Sonic Lost World, which fits neither. Sonic 3D Blast would be an important step to define what to do and what not to do, as the game is not all that fun nor is the level design very well thought out, so it was an important step stone in crafting what would be Sonic Adventure. SA1 defines what would be the staple for the 3D Sonic titles before the boost era, but with its philosophy still being somewhat present in those, it introduces faster gameplay, with less platforming than before but reaching a good compromise between speed, platforming and exploration. Levels are more open here as a result of the attempt to recreate Sonic's gameplay from the classics in 3D, which would end up distancing itself from that as development progressed. 
SA2 isn't exactly a sequel to SA1's level design, going for a more linear and smaller approach, but in a good way. Levels are fun, fluid, rapid and feature very fun gimmicks. They are really different to be considered a sequel, but they are a very good take on what SA1 built. They are smoother and built with more attention and detail, and the decisions are more mature and make more sense overall. Heroes is a very different take on what the adventures built, with a very different gameplay, controlling three characters at once, the level designs are built to accommodate these abilities and thus feature a lot of different elements and are unique enough to distinguish themselves from the adventures. There's some stuff to be improved, but there's also a lot that was done right, and still follows a lot of the philosophies that the adventures established. 06 would be the sequel to SA1's level design. It expands on it by making the levels feel bigger, focusing on fleshing out the pathing system, resulting in a lot of different routes to take in a lot of levels while also feeling very fluid and smooth. For a game like it, they are really well built, and I would say that, for the sections that are good, they are just as good, if not better, than what was seen in SA1 or SA2. They are well thought out and take advantage of the characters' movesets a lot, though there are still a lot of segments that feel uninspired, unpolished and just bad, where they perish compared to SA1 for the lack of consistency. Lastly, Sonic Lost World isn't exactly a continuation of the adventure gameplay or level design, but not neither is it of the boost games. It does follow some of the philosophies present in those games, while also taking some influences from other games in this era. But it doesn't really achieve anything. It's a weird case of its own, as it differentiates itself a lot from the other games, but doesn't really bring anything new to the table that's really worth talking about. Contrary to the classics, where you could make a case for how the level designs have evolved over the years, what has been changed for the best or for the worst, and what changes have been made, in this era it's much harder to determine. SA1 establishes something, SA2 goes for its own take on that, Heroes completely changes everything up, 06 goes back to the first formula, and then Lost World does another thing of its own. What causes this is Sonic Team trying to innovate where they shouldn't have, probably. The change from SA1 to SA2 is fine, it does feel like an evolution from one game to another, even though the level designs follow a pretty distinct philosophy, but then going from what SA1 and SA2 established to Heroes, everything seems so different. It's like it has a little bit of a mix of the previous two games while mostly being its own thing. Then 06 decides that the Heroes formula isn't good enough, and goes back to what made people love the adventure so much. Then Lost World doesn't really matter, does it? In my opinion, if Sonic Team wanted to carry out the adventures as level design, they should have done what 06 did after Heroes and carry that out, instead of making it more and more confusing. You know, carry the process and philosophy out like they did with the classics, even though all games are basically adventure but with gimmicks. I do understand that they wanted to innovate in an industry that was becoming more and more competitive by the day, but if it isn't broken, then maybe don't try to fix it so hard. Not saying at all that maybe they shouldn't have gone for it, as making errors is an important step in making something good, but they could have probably been way more consistent if they mostly stuck with what they knew worked well for Sonic. But that was about to change, as we'll be entering the boost era with Sonic Unleashed. <laughs> Sonic Unleashed is the first game that introduces the main mechanic that Sonic games would revolve around until this day, the boost. Well, technically it was introduced in Sonic Heroes in the special stages, but it wouldn't be turned into an actual move until Sonic Rush for the DS, being fully fleshed out in Unleashed. The boost is a move that turns Sonic into a destructive high-speed projectile. In gameplay, it's a technique that not only allows the player to run at vastly increased speeds for as long as the movie is active, but also to damage or destroy enemies and breakable obstacles by simply running into them during the boost, all without taking damage or slowing down, only taking damage by being crushed or falling on spikes for example. It can also be activated for a small speed boost in midair and let Sonic run over any body of water. Momentum also plays less of a role here, as the instant burst of speed takes away most of the purpose of having Sonic accelerate a lot on downhill 
hills and such. He still does, but it's toned down a lot. And the fact that Sonic can still accelerate normally makes it more than just a run button like what was seen in Lost World. It's expected that the level layout has to be changed massively from what was seen previously to accommodate this new ability. The choice to include it in 3D was so the next Sonic games could distance themselves from 06, as Sonic Team felt the old adventure gameplay was saturated and dead after the failure of 06, even though it wasn't that terribly executed. As a result, levels are much more linear now, with Sonic mostly going in one direction in the sections that are built to use the boost continuously, with big open roads and enemies to run through, while also having some objects and other paths to take where you can get collectibles. Stages are quicker, there is a lot less platforming in 3D, though that is somewhat compensated in the new 2D sections, that feature a lot more elements from the classics, like loops, downhill slopes and platforms. People usually say that the boost here causes the game to be really automated, which there is no denying that it is a little bit, as the complexity of controls and tricks to perform is definitely lower, and also that Sonic controls like he's in a racing game now, but if you think about it, it's the best compromise that could be achieved when trying to integrate Sonic's true speed in 3D. It's hard to say if this is better or not, as it's up to the individual to decide if this new style suits Sonic or not, with some saying that it's fun, fluid and what Sonic is about, that being speed, and others will say that it isn't fun, that it's a shallow, boring playstyle, and that Sonic is about platforming and momentum, and that the boost is completely taking away its identity. Regardless of what my opinion on this is, which is that neither of the playstyles are perfect or ideal for that matter, and all the dividedness and criticism, I think what has been done in Unleashed is a step in the right direction considering the circumstances. Sonic needed a refresh if it was going to compete with its contemporaries, and refreshed it was. So much in fact, that they even introduced the Werehog in this game, which I'll get into in a bit. As for the Hedgehog though, new moves are introduced like the Quick Step, the Drift and the Stomp, which is a new take on the Bound Jump, but without the bounce. These mechanics help to vary the gameplay and slow it down a little, as you'll be running at the speed of sound for most of it, although some of these new mechanics are just okay, some being a really shallow concept and being used in less than fun sequences that overstay their welcome, while others are really important and are actually utilized to their potential. The levels, besides being built around the boost, are also built around these new abilities and Sonic's controls, which are quite different from what we are used to. He's much more stiff than usual, which is a side effect of him moving really fast, so the levels are wider to take into consideration how far he drifts into a corner for example. The drift isn't perfect, though it's a very good addition. I feel it would have been much better if it was tighter and not so wide, so Sonic could actually take tighter turns. Besides that, Sonic moving really fast even when he's not boosting is also a problem when you need to land precise jumps, especially in 3D. Though I said that there was much less platforming in 3D, that doesn't mean that there isn't any. A good example of this is in the section of Sky Scraper's Camper, where Sonic can either go through the middle, run through a pipe and jump from platform to platform to reach this area, or go through the left and attempt to go along this pipe without falling off. He accelerates so fast that you have no time or ability to turn and will end up falling most of the time. Sections like this just don't work at all for these controls. On the 2D side, these segments are more focused on platforming and decision making than the 3D sections, which usually involve boosting, some sort of combat and fast platforming and clearing up gaps, not containing very deep platforming. The 2D segments are more about exploring the environment, and finding out the fastest way to go through them with the layout that is presented to you, rewarding the player for replaying and memorizing the stage, while also appealing to the less experienced player 
players by providing a slower gameplay. There are also multiple paths to take here, though this system isn't very deep, as these sections don't really flesh out this element of the level design. The same goes for the 3D segments. There are some other routes that you can take, or areas that you can go to which are usually faster and contain collectibles, but there is more focus put into a main path here than multiple branching paths. Oh yeah, there exist medals now which are mandatory for progression, so they are scattered all around the levels, with some being really well hidden which makes for a good bit of exploration, some being present in harder to reach paths, and others being given for free, which is fine I guess. Those stages are frequently more linear and narrower, there are still some segments that are actually quite open, and this varies depending on what element of the gameplay the stage is focused on. For example, Skyscraper Scamper is more open, thus having more routes to take and numerous areas to explore, while Windmill Isle is more focused on speed and going as fast as possible through the level, thus being more linear and narrower with less diverging and converging paths. Sure, there is an argument to be had if the stages are too linear, but I don't really think they are. I do know that when you think about some stages level design, it mostly consists in going in a straight line, but it doesn't really become a problem as it's not like you can just press boost and win like in forces, but I'll reserve that for later in the video. These stages still give you shit to do, multiple routes to take and are still challenging. You'll just end up dying if you're only pressing the boost and jumping, and if you play like that, then you're the problem rather than the game, because only a maniac plays like that. A negative thing in Sonic's level designs are quick time events. I don't really think anyone particularly likes these. I haven't seen anyone exactly praise them at least. It's not like they are bad or anything, they're just really boring and bland and don't make much sense. Level design is also weird as hell sometimes, but I don't really think it's properly shit at any point in the game. I would argue that it's very creative and not bland at all. There are a lot of tricks that you can perform, most of it is only boring if you make it boring, though the game does trick you sometimes in thinking you're doing a lot of cool shit when the game is actually just automatically bouncing you around with springs. And dash panels also correct your direction a lot, which I'm not a fan of. But yeah, in hindsight, this is nowhere near as bad as it will become. Even then, there is no point in normalizing this issue, especially when it comes to this game. Sonic fans tend to normalize issues rather than discussing them, especially when it comes to games they like. And even though I like Unleashed, I do want to stress that it introducing the boost created a lot of problems that will only become more evident as time goes by, some of which already show here, like the automation. Gimmicks are also fun, mostly. The stages don't have many weird or specific stage gimmicks, but the ones that are present are chill, like the balloons in Rooftop Run or the bobsled in Cool Edge and Eggman Land. For a first time, the level design is not that bad. At all, it's really good actually. This smooth transition was probably helped by the fact that the gameplay is not all that new, as it was utilized in Rush so they could take inspiration from there, but what also helped was the maturity of the team on constructing 3D levels and environments now, even though there is still room for improvement. Above all, the gameplay flows really nicely and it feels really good to play, which is a good sign. It should be less automated no doubt about that, and it should also let the player have more of a say on where Sonic goes and how he goes to such places, but I think it's still fine. As for the Werehog, the gameplay is really, really different. It's basically God of War meets Sonic, but less inspired and fleshed out. The level design itself isn't all that bad, though it isn't that great either. The gameplay here is slower, as it is heavily focused on combat and clearing rooms full of enemies. But there are a lot of these segments which exist seemingly at random and for the sake of existing, which really kills the pace of the run and aren't always good. The stages that are quicker in terms of combat are usually the most fun ones for me compared to the latter ones, though the Werehog being at a low level does help in him feeling slower, as he takes longer to kill enemies and can't use attacks that make him dash forwards. There is also a puzzling element added here to change things up. Most of them are nothing more than fine, some of them are definitely interesting though, and some of them are particularly shit like Arid Sands. The gameplay also takes advantage of the physics to assist in the combat and puzzling, where you can 
can, for example, grab some enemies and throw them at others to kill them. Or grab crates to climb on them and grab a metal, stuff like that. Metal exploration is also one of the biggest aspects of the Werehog experience, as they are very well hidden in these levels and really require some thinking and exploration skills, which are also aided by some sort of parkour or climbing. On that note, these are by far the best uses of the Werehog gameplay. There are some levels, such as Skyscraper's Camper again, in which you have to climb something, in this case a clock tower. For the less experienced player this can seem like a chore, but for the more familiar player these sections are great and really reward you for memorizing the layouts and timing your jumps and abilities right. And I like that a lot. Gimmicks are creative and are actually good most of the times in my opinion, or at least not very offensive. It also brings back some gimmicks from other games like the Moving Stones in SA1, where you had to place them in a sort of shrine to access some stages. Levels are also generally more open, though there are some that are more linear, mostly the introduction levels, as they are used to familiarize this new playstyle, but the later stages eventually become a lot more open, such as Eggman Land. <laughs> This is my magnificent empire, made possible through my genius and the limitless energy harnessed from Dark Gaia. Sonic, if you have any complaints, come deliver them to me in person. If you can, that is. Eggman Land is definitely something of its own. It's the ultimate challenge of this game, a stage that mixes the Hedgehog and Werehog playstyles. It has a ton of routes to take, the easier to take are really fucking hard, and the ones that are harder to access treat you with a faster time and also by skipping the really hard parts, though you can't really avoid them all. Sonic segments mostly focus on very precise platforming, in claustrophobic rooms that are full of obstacles that can one-shot you, though a lot of them are just waiting for things to happen which is kind of annoying and it also doesn't work all that well considering that Sonic is really fast for this type of gameplay but when it works it works really damn well even the 3d sections are focused in avoiding really hard obstacles and overcoming pretty difficult pieces of fast platforming it's both a very welcome challenge as Sonic stages were not all that difficult throughout the game but at the same time the fact that Sonic's controls are not built very well for this type of gameplay it can be frustrating at times. They are two sides of the same coin basically. The Werehog segments are usually focused on combat as is tradition, while also revolving around slow and precise platforming, which does work much better than Sonic's but can still be frustrating if you're not very good at the game rather than it being a problem on the level design's end. There are also some extra DLC levels in this game, but there is not much to say about them. Some are fun and are cool challenges, but at the same time it's really easy to notice that these are not very polished, or at all really. So yeah, they are not very memorable. As for the SD version, which I'll cover very briefly, the stages are simpler and more linear, though still fun with some branching paths to take. Featuring some platforming, though not much, and the game seems to flow well but also also suffers a lot more from automation than its HD counterpart. Lastly, I think that the level themes are really good. They represent perfectly the feeling that we're actually traveling all over the world, with every place being faithfully recreated from what they feel like in real life, but with a cartoony twist. And each culture is represented very well, making it feel more alive and authentic. The graphics and lighting effects and such are better than ever, which just makes carrying out the vision the developers have much easier. Concluding, Sonic Unleashed is a very different game from what we are used to at this point. It introduces two new gameplay styles, one of which will be the main gameplay style for Sonic going forward. It introduces an almost entirely different philosophy for level design and gameplay, focusing even more on speed and fast platforming rather than actual exploration and slower gameplay, and it probably took a step in the right direction to propel Sonic into a new age. There is a lot of stuff to be improved here, no doubt, but improved they will be eventually. As for now, we'll be taking a look at Sonic Colors.
Sonic Colors is supposed to be the continuation of the philosophy and concepts that Sonic Unleashed established. Though it isn't exactly an evolution of what was seen two years prior, it's not exactly a downgrade. For starters, I do have to say that 3D is probably the most automated from what we have seen so far. This is due to multiple reasons, one of which is that the levels are mostly built around spectacle. There are a ton of set pieces where Sonic is just thrown into a scripted sequence and you're forced to watch it like a cutscene. Sure, Unleashed did this to some degree, but Colors really emphasizes that. The environments look very nice and unique, which helps with this, but I feel like it's a mistake that Sonic Team keep making, not being able to mix spectacle and good gameplay, or engaging gameplay at least. A notorious stage for doing this is Starlight Carnival Act 1, where you basically only control Sonic for 30 seconds in uninspired quick-step sequences and two home attack chains. You're basically watching an interactive cutscene. Sure, it looks nice and the spectacle is great, but it's not good level design or gameplay intrinsically. Though there are a lot of good 3D sections still, such as the introduction sequence in Tropical Resort, which is great, and introduces the player to the type of gameplay that Unleashed presented us, while also making way for different mechanics and gimmicks. Planet Wisp also makes great use of that, while almost perfectly mixing speed, spectacle, fun set pieces and platforming. The gameplay itself is a lot slower, as Sonic doesn't get boost from destroying enemies or grabbing rings anymore. You get it by running into the White Wisp capsules. This means that the game now dictates where you should and shouldn't use the boost, as it's very unlikely that you'll be able to keep the boost you got from one capsule throughout the entire stage. <laughs> The 2D sections make up at least more than half of the Sonic Colors experience, which is often a big point of criticism surrounding it, where people say that it's not a 3D Sonic game, it's rather a 2D one. And it's a really saturated critic, isn't it? It's not like because the game is mostly 2D that it's bad, considering that the 2D sections are very solid for the most part. I do understand that if you go into this game expecting Unleashed 2, then you'll be disappointed. They are slower sections compared to Unleashed, yes, focusing more on platforming and exploration, but control much better than in that game, introducing the double jump and also Sonic speed being toned down, making for a less frustrating experience at least. Some gimmicks introduced here are fun like the falling badniks in Sweet Mountain, making for a sort of climbing sequence until you reach a spring, which is interesting. Some are overly tedious, where you just have to wait for obstacles to move or shit to happen, or stand on a button, then when you reach a laser, go to the next button, repeating this starting and stopping over and over again. Level design is sometimes confusing as well, which is mostly the gimmick's fault, as they don't always work well with the level geometry or layout for that matter. There are also some spots where you can't predict a bottomless pit at all, but then when you think you can, there is no pit, you just can't see what's under the camera. They are inconsistent mostly. Also, a difference in stages is that they are are now divided by acts, not in two, but in six. I think it wasn't supposed to be like this when the game was first conceived, but as development went on, they probably decided to split them because of the Wii's capabilities. Guess we'll find out about that in my next video. But yeah, act one and two are the main acts of each stage, being the more fleshed out and longer ones, which are usually the best in the game, for the most part. The other ones are discussable. While some are very good, introducing new gimmicks and fun sections of platforming and exploration, which are very well thought out and simply well designed in my opinion, others are just terrible. Good examples of this, or terrible ones rather, are the levels that contain these yellow springs that follow you around. They are an interesting concept in paper, where they will bounce Sonic up to platforms he can explore and collect some stuff in an auto-scroller stage, but they do not work well at all. They move in unpredictable ways, the levels are designed horribly for this sort of gimmick, and they're just executed terribly wrong. These stages are more focused on platforming than anything else, so they are a little experimental, but they don't always achieve anything at all. Some do, as I've said, making great use of the wisps, like the cube levels, where you have to time your ability right, in order to turn the blue rings into solid blocks at the right moment. And if you don't, you'll then fall into a harder path that will probably lead to your death. 
Oh yeah, I haven't talked about the wisps, have I? The very first thing you notice when booting up the game are these weird little creatures called wisps. The wisps are exactly creatures that you can rescue by running into their capsules that are scattered around the stages. Long story short, they're the main gimmick of the game. Some of them, like the laser wisp, are mainly used to skip parts of the level as it blasts you in the direction you point at. And you can go even further if you hit prisms or this rock. But the other wisps are completely different playstyles. They offer very solid moments and change things up from time to time, like being able to discover collectibles hidden in the sky or underground, or hidden behind blocks that only certain wisps can break, rewarding the player by reading the level design well and using the level geometry to their advantage, offering very satisfying moments overall. They can both be the best part of colors and the worst part of colors. For starters, you can skip most of the levels with them, turning what could be complex and engaging pieces of platforming into nothing. Their stop and start and just slow nature, clunky controls and, above all, their overuse, considering that they are highly situational and can't always be taken advantage of in a positive way, turning what could be a very deep and fun mechanic into a very tedious one by the end of the game. And it never goes past being just a gimmick, rather than an actual game mechanic that Sonic can take advantage of. Of. At their best, they were very fun elements that incentivized exploration and were actually used in pretty clever ways, and at their worst, they were just terrible to deal with. It gets even worse when you consider that you don't even have all wisps unlocked from the start, meaning that you have to unlock them at later stages and then come back to earlier stages just to collect red rings and whatnot, making the first playthrough of the stages probably kind of... Annoying? I wouldn't say annoying, just bland, as they are mostly built with all the wisps in mind, and the routes without the wisps are not very engaging at their core anyways. Well, you don't even have to use the wisps to finish the game. At all. Okay, I'm exaggerating. But you only really need them in the latter stages of the game, as you can easily go through more than half of the game without ever pressing the shoulder button. If you don't like the wisps, then this is probably good for you, but it just disappoints honestly, considering that they are supposed to be the main mechanic of the game, and they just don't work how you would expect a power-up to work like. They are supposed to, you know, power you up, but I just end up wanting to ignore them most times. But once again, at their best, they are very good tools for exploration and just playing through the stages, and do add some replay value, though most of it is sort of artificial. In general, the level design here is solid. It could be much, much better, and no doubt about that, and does feel less consistent and fun even when compared to Unleashed, which was more of both. Probably because the game wasn't entirely Sonic, but yeah. But when it has its moments, it does have its moments. The game generally flows well and feels good to play, besides some clunky wisps. Looking very good, featuring very creative settings that really sell the dreamy and amusement park atmosphere. And it's kind of crazy how they managed that in the Wii. Wisps could have been used better and the gimmicks could have been less boring but I think that the game is still very much enjoyable, and that there are still some pretty good levels, making for an overall pleasant and smooth experience, though a somewhat flawed one. I feel like what's missing in Sonic games most times is not that there aren't any good levels, it's just that there's a lack of consistency. This might be because of several reasons, either they can't combine good gameplay and spectacle, they try to be overly creative, or maybe fatigue starts setting in at some point in development. I wonder if they will ever get consistent. Oh wait, they do, in Sonic Generations. <laughs> Thank you.
Sonic Generations is a game that takes the positives in both Unleashed and Colors and improves them, but also takes their negatives and mostly fixes them. Generations is a celebration game, meant to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Sonic. Given this, 9 levels were chosen from 9 mainline Sonic games to feature, 3 from the classic era, 3 from the Dreamcast era and 3 from the modern era, with each one having 2 acts, one for modern Sonic, featuring the gameplay we have seen in Unleashed and Colors, and also Classic Sonic, a recreation of the classic gameplay adapted to the new 2D level design. Starting with a boost gameplay, and I'll quickly get it out of the way, this is the best iteration of it until this day in my opinion. Sonic feels a little bit slower in this game compared to Unleashed, though I have seen multiple sources claiming that he is in fact slower, others say that he is the same speed, regardless of that he does feel slower, but not in a bad way. He controls much better, being less clunky and stiff, making for easier turns, better feeling jumps and better platforming in 3D even. His levels are really really good, with fun gimmicks for the most part that are inspired from each stage's respective game, while also remixing them, such as the max speed in Crisis City, while introducing new ones, such as the Clouds in Sky Sanctuary. Platforming is good for the majority of it, being quick, fun and engaging. Though Sonic doesn't have the double jump here, he's slower in 2D than in Unleashed, making for more precise platforming sections with multiple branching paths, with the usual harder paths to reach being faster and the easier paths being slower, while also featuring collectibles and hidden areas in alternative routes, reaching a better balance of speed than in Unleashed where he was too fast and in Colors where he was too slow, while even enabling the use of the boost in these sections, being smoother and flowing much better overall. Isn't that great? The way the levels are designed also allow for a lot of speedrunning potential, playing with level geometry, creating numerous possibilities of tricks and strats and it, once again, makes you feel really cool while playing and that means that it's good. Automation is still present though it's a little bit toned down compared to Unleashed I feel, where it's used does help a lot with the spectacle though, which is present a ton, with practically every single stage having a sequence that's not very deep gameplay wise, but features some great spectacle, something that the devs still struggle with, but it's gotten better here I think. Sonic's moveset has been tweaked and refined as well. For example, the drift is much tighter here, which was a critic that I had with Unleashed, if you remember, which was too wide. It also controls much better and is more responsive, allowing for tighter turns and more complex drifting segments, which the game does have like in Speed Highway. Sonic also went back to the jump dash rather than the double jump, which in my opinion is the ability that needs tweaking the most. When Sonic homing attacked in SA1, SA2 and even Heroes, Sonic would go in a straight line then carry the inertia from the action, not losing much speed and being able to continue building its acceleration and momentum. Since Sonic Unleashed and maybe even in 06 a little, the jump dash is basically a vertical rocket that sends Sonic straight for a few meters then immediately drops him down where he stands. He carries no speed from the action and it just feels like if this was changed so it was more like the adventures then it would be really good for platforming and would be used as an actually viable speedrunning strategy. On the topic of platforming, I've already talked about it in 2D, but there is also some platforming in 3D. Though it's still very reduced, contrary to Unleashed, it never disappoints in my opinion, though it doesn't exactly blow your mind. The platforming segments mix very well the boost speed with jumping and homing attack on enemies, taking advantage of the air boost, and it all works well mostly because of Sonic's improved controls. People usually say that the controls are the same in Unleashed and Generations, but they really aren't. Sure, the core movement is really similar, but it's still tweaked positively here. Stages generally reward skill, being polished and very quick to go through, not because they are small or anything, but because when you get good at them and start to memorize the level layouts and the fastest threats to finish the stage, it all flows smoothly like water, while also being big enough and having an exploration aspect for those who aren't as experienced with the 
game or Sonic in general, letting the player take their own decisions and learning the game at their own pace, thus incentivizing replayability. Levels are still linear, there is no denying that, as they are usually focused on going on a straight line for most of the time, though this has been noticeably mitigated, are not very open most times and don't allow any type of backtracking still. It's the same deal as it was with Unleashed, there's still a lot of stuff to do, lots of paths to take, lots of obstacles and it's not boost to win, still. There still exist some sections like that, I won't deny it, but not only is it less noticeable now, but it's less frequent too. As for Classic Sonic, as I've said, his gameplay is a sort of recreation of the classic gameplay, though adapted to the new era. As such, the physics aren't 100% faithful, but they are close enough for what the level design asks of them. His levels mostly follow a sort of mix between the classic's design philosophy and modern Sonic 2D sections, which I think probably works better with his new physics than the straight-up classic designs, as he's really fast. His spin dash specifically is really, really overpowered. A well-timed spin dash jump will make you skip entire sections of level geometry without the blink of an eye, which does undeniably feel good to perform and to watch, but it's a poor choice of design in paper. Some stages do take this into account though, and even reward the player by granting them access to another path or route that leads them to an item box or collectible. As for paths, they don't exactly follow the system seen in Sonic 3, it mostly adopts a system closer to what is seen in Sonic 2, which is simpler and easier to read, but still fine. News here are the levels for all the stages that classic Sonic never featured in, or never even had 2D in the first place, which are very good generally. I'm not gonna sit here and lie, saying that when I replay Generations I do it because of the classic levels, I don't, alright? But these stages are, and I can't stress this enough, good. Great, I would say. The platforming works well and is fun most of the time. Physics don't exist exactly work like in the classic, specifically momentum, but it flows well, the controls are good and the levels feature classic Sonic staples, loops, slopes, ramps, all of that, and that's great to see. Gimmicks are usually very good too, considering that most of them never existed in a 2D scenario, like the truck chase in City Escape, where the truck loops around some segments and destroys scaffoldings that you have to climb to progress to the next section, also contributing to the spectacle factor which is executed very well here for the most part. A great example of it, in my opinion, is the rock chase section from Seaside Hill. It's a great combination of spectacle and the player actually doing something, as you have to platform a lot here and make some precise jumps as to not get ran over. Some gimmicks are weird though, like the wisps in Planet Wisp, even though they have been featured in 2D areas in colors, but they don't really work well here at all, and it's probably the stage that's designed the worst here. It's really really bad honestly, and is perhaps the only stage that I don't like from this game. It's a really slow level, with very confusing level design and really shallow gimmicks. I also realized that a lot of stages here have some sort of storyline. I know it's weird, but hear me out. In Seaside Hill, you have to run away from a rock that chases you. In Crisis City, you have to run behind the goalpost, which has been sucked by the tornado. And it helps with the stages being unique in their own way, and not just part of a compilation. They are vivid, with almost no empty places where nothing is going on or looks bad. Stages are colorful, stylized, and are faithful recreations of their original counterparts while also looking more modern. The lighting and particle effects are great as well, making each respective art style stand out even more, such as the confetti in rooftop run which makes the stage look incredible. Levels are also really detailed and full of references from other games, like the posters in City Escape and the flags from each region from Sonic Unleashed in rooftop run. I also almost completely forgot about skills, because I never used them in this game. Some extend the level design designed to some degree, others I don't really know what to say. All in all, Sonic Generations is a great game. For me, till this day, it's the best the Boost gameplay has ever gotten. It's smooth, fluid and just feels really good to play, of which a lot of the merit belongs to the levels, which are really unique, alive and lovingly built to really enhance the experience. It's a little bit sad that most of that would go to waste though, as Sonic Forces would be released.
Sonic Forces is supposed to be the sequel to Sonic Generations, the game that would improve from that where it needed to, and would further strengthen the philosophies present in the Boost games after the reckless experiment that was Lost World, but instead, it just worsens what was good about Generations, and embraces that game's flaws and manages to craft something worse with impressively bad level design, but I'll get into that in a bit, as I do want to cover what it did right first, which is still something. Firstly, I do want to stress that there are some good levels here, such as Network Terminal, Egg Gate, Capital City, Park Avenue, and arguably, maybe even Mortar Canyon and Metropolitan Highway. Let's quickly take a look at Network Terminal. You start out in a scripted sequence, where you are then thrown into the wild with three options available. Go straight forward, where you'll fall down and have to grab a pulley to go up again, where you'll see two enemies that you have quote unquote to defeat to bounce on this spring and get on the rail. Or you can go to the right and stay on the same level, where you'll skip the path underneath and the enemies as well and end on the rail. From this rail you'll be able to ride the zipline, which looks and works slightly differently from the regular ones, which will then throw you on another rail. From this new rail you can either continue forward or take other two rails, one of which will kill you by the way, and both will end at one of three different tubes in this segment, one of which grants you a red star ring. The one that does grant you the red star ring though, is sort of camouflaged to the left of the starting sequence, and I didn't really know it existed until recently, where if you ride it, you'll be prompted to destroy two enemies, bounce on a spring and ride a zipline and we'll end on the tubes and skip all the other segments. It seems weird that a path that is as easy to access as the other one skips that much of the level, considering that you don't have to do much here besides pressing the A button four times, but I'll reserve my judgement for later. After the tubes, you'll be back on rails again, where you can either ride the zipline to skip the rest of the rails or keep riding them to collect a red star ring. The 2D section is where this stage shines in my opinion, as you can slide through very small gaps underneath the ground which will cut some sections and lead you to new routes, making for a very interesting segment. The platforming gimmicks are also really good in my opinion, they are hard to get the hang of at first, but you'll get to appreciate them as you learn how to use them to your advantage, such as these platforms that spin with the weight of the falling liquid, of which you have to be careful of, because it can send you straight to a bottomless pit. The way Sonic can just glide through this area also feels really satisfying, which is a plus, making use of the air boost and the homing attack. The last section of the stage is mostly automated, but it's primarily focused on spectacle, which is fine I guess. Sadly, not all stages are like this in forces. Sadly, a rule of thumb for the stages in this game is that they are really short, even in the good stages this is a problem, and they are also very, and I mean very automated, to the point that you almost never have any real control over the character, with some stages having rows upon rows of boost panels and springs and scripted sequences that just look ridiculous, not even having much of a spectacle going on. Even though multiple branching paths are somewhat explored and used in this game, for most levels levels they are really bland, and don't really add anything to the experience or have anything going on at all. Levels are actually quite empty sometimes, even taking into account that the stages are really linear and, once again, small and very narrow, this time almost always consisting in going in a straight line, with no obstacles in sight to remotely present any challenge at all. You can literally beat most levels by just pressing boost or walking forwards, and these issues don't apply only for modern Sonic. The game doesn't have any sort of mechanism for lazy playing. It's actually baffling how the game lets you get away with this. You can stop right in the face of most enemies and they won't do anything to you, they'll just stare at you endlessly. Of course, as I've said, not all stages are terrible, some are good, but most times nothing better than okay or just bad. Mortar Canyon, for example, is a fun stage to play, with good spectacle and it feels quite alive 
with, also being more open and featuring numerous routes to take. But when you actually go and analyze it, it becomes evident that there is nothing going on. Enemies don't exactly attack you, the openness is mostly filled with a void where there is nothing happening, and the other routes are not only boring and uninspired, but are even slower than the main path. It's all an illusion. I know they really wanted to sell that illusion shit and distorted reality with the Phantom Ruby, but they didn't need to go this far. On the topic of the Phantom Ruby, it also works as a sort of gimmick in this game in some levels. Well, realistically the only one I can think of is Capital City. And it works quite well there, where it plays with gravity and turns the avatar upside down and makes for a really good spectacle, the in-between cutscenes in the level really sell the feeling that Infinite is messing with you. Gimmicks are usually fine, I guess? They are not very deep or creative nor memorable, though some deserve honorable mentions, like the spinning platforms in Network Terminal, and the platforms that move forwards in Metropolitan Highway, which do add some depth to the platforming. What usually brings the moments where the game does feel remotely good are, once again, automation and mainly the controls. The controls for all characters are also really, really clunky. Not only Sonic's moveset stripped down with the removal of the drift, getting rid of any potential engaging gameplay this game could have had, and there are still some sections that could have used it, but boost pads are apparently better. But he controls like shit, as do the Avatar and Classic Sonic. When you turn with them, they move really slowly, they accelerate a lot out of nowhere, they just don't feel any good to control. Classic Sonic specifically controls nothing like he did in Generations. He's clunky, slow, doesn't accelerate right, he doesn't move right. He his stages are built for movement that he does not have, it's all very confusing and weird. The levels are slightly, and I mean slightly, fun to play if you're speedrunning though, as the game does have some cool tricks and strategies, but that's probably the only scenario where you can take something positive from them, as they are not engaging, they are not hard, and most times they are not even fun. I know it feels contradicting, but that's what the game is anyways, contradicting. There also exist tech team stages, which are all pretty bad, as you can just use the wisps and skip most of them. They are not engaging at all and what elements they do have of notable, they are not even good gameplay elements at their core. Lastly, the episode shadow levels are okay, usually. They are nothing special, but they are pretty satisfying to run through, as once again, 2D can be really satisfying in this game. The water slide sucks though, both for shadow and the avatar. To be honest, I don't even know what more to say. Forces has some merit which I won't take away, but most of it is outshitted by many of its mistakes and blandness. It's an uninspired title that really just makes you uninspired to comment on it. And going from generations to this, it's like going from heaven to hell. Sonic Forces' level design falls short for the lack of consistent and concise ideas that only get explored for 15 seconds. It does look nice, the atmosphere is very well crafted, the lighting and particle effects are very impressive and the spectacle that exists often doesn't is a point, and there are a lot of cool details here which are great, but most of the things are sometimes boring and not always creative, but are easily one of the best parts of this game by simply not being too offensive. With what we have seen, there are only two options, we either go even more downhill, or we really get things going again, and I'm happy to announce that we are going downhill. Nah, I'm joking, I think what was done in Frontiers might just be good. Frontiers is the latest mainline Sonic game to date. After the failure of Forces, Sonic Team decided that they had to do something to change the fate of the franchise, and something they did. The most important aspect of this game are the open zones, which are... 
exactly that. Islands that you can explore, where you can collect stuff, engage in combat, and where most of the story is to be played. I won't focus much on the level design of the islands, as they deserve a video of its own, honestly, but I can say that they are pretty fun to go through for the most part, with lots of stuff to do, puzzles to solve, areas to explore, bosses and enemies to fight, also featuring some type of mini levels within them. I'm a big fan of them, I think they're a very nice touch. It's arguable if any of this content adds to the game's replayability or not, or if they are a quote-unquote flawed masterpiece, but that's a whole different argument to be had which would have to be in another video, but for now I can say that it's impressive that Sonic Team crammed the content they did into the islands and that I do like most of it, though they are boring and deserted sometimes. What you can also find in the islands are these portals, called the cyberspace portals. These ones lead you to stages like we are used to from other games, where I'll be focusing in this section. The first thing you'll notice here gameplay-wise is how Sonic controls. He isn't nearly as stiff as he was on Forces, being the closest he has been to the adventure controls since 06, or maybe even Lost World. He's also much slower than he was on the previous games, which helps a lot with platforming in 3D, which is much more utilized here, and also helps with the stages feeling longer than they actually are for the most part. He also has the double jump again as he did in Forces, for mostly the same reasons as that game. As I've said, the stages here are still quite short, some of them are larger, or at least feel that way, which is helped by Sonic Speed being nerfed, and some of them are actually bigger than what was seen in Forces, but they are not the main focus of the game anymore, so it's only natural that they are not as big. I do think that the levels are really fun to go through, for the most part at least, as some are too experimental I would say. There isn't as much automation anymore, there is still some, sure, but it's been reduced a lot, even though the way the level design is built still follows basically the same structure as Forces did, but without a billion boost pads always correcting your direction. Stages are generally harder than what we have been treated with recently, though some of them are still pretty free, are not boost to win since Sonic cannot kill enemies with it anymore while also being much slower, and once again are more focused on platforming than anything, with the 2D sections being almost entirely made of platforming segments and the 3D ones generally reaching a balance between it and speed, which is possible due to Sonic's new physics. On the same note, Sonic has the drop dash as well, which works better in 2D than in 3D for some reason, allowing the developers to introduce more elements of the classics in the 2D level design, or at least in theory. If the physics are well coded, and if Sonic's momentum and acceleration in this state make sense is a different question though. It seems like sometimes it works well, while other times it doesn't. They surely don't work most of the time while using the boost, as Sonic doesn't gain any type of acceleration in a downhill in this state. Another gripe I have with the physics are with the boost itself and the light speed dash, since they behave weirdly. For the boost to work, you gotta press the boost button and tilt the joystick either up, down, left or right for Sonic to move. When you stop though, it doesn't exactly work like it did in the previous games, where Sonic would keep his speed and then progressively slow down as he didn't receive any input. Here he just full stops. The same goes for the light speed dash, where sometimes he'll even stop at the end of a trail of rings for a second before being able to move again, which just feels off. About the 3D section specifically, as I've said, contrary to forces, you're actually platforming a lot more here than actually boosting your way through these segments. There are still some sections like that, but it focuses more on platforming and combat or a combination of both, making for a slower experience than you would expect most times, though it plays and feels good most of the time. Same goes for 2D, though it's less consistent at that. The platforming itself is satisfying, I do especially like how you combine 
design abilities in this game, as it's harder to perform because of how Sonic controls overall, focusing more on precision and exploration than what was seen in Unleashed and Generations. Sure, Forces was still like this to some degree, but the boost was really overpowered and Sonic was slippery as hell, so yeah, it's much better executed here. There are also some levels where the gimmicks used are really good, with level design that's built very well around them, and others where they are pretty bland and uninspired and the level design doesn't help one bit, where Sonic just feels slow and clunky to move around and doesn't flow very well. There aren't many of them that are new, most of the ones that are quote unquote new are reskins of gimmicks from other games, but I think that they are still well implemented, like the clouds and that spring that will keep rising as you hit it. A gimmick that I really like, though it isn't a gimmick really, it's more of a mechanic, is the new stomp jump, whereas in the previous games you would stomp and Sonic would stop where he was, he auto jumps now, functioning similarly to the bound jump in SA2 and 06, and there are multiple sections of the levels that take advantage of this which just makes it better. Sure, you could stomp and then jump afterwards, but having it as an actual ability that works faster than that method allows for new sections to be crafted with a more complex use of it. It would have been cool to have sections that would rely on timing for this, but I digress. I do want to talk about the drift gimmick in this game, which is terrible, I think we can all agree on that. It's slow, controls terribly and doesn't make any sense for it to exist, to the point that it's better to avoid the pads that activate this mechanic than actually going through them. I feel like it was just a way to assure the player that Sonic Team hasn't forgotten about this ability, but probably doesn't even know what to do with it either. If you paid attention to the previous segment, you would have heard me say that some gimmicks are taken from previous games. You'd be surprised to know that most of the cyberspace levels are either full reskins of previous levels, a mix of multiple levels, or of an original design and then some sections from other levels. There are still fully original levels from what was discovered so far, which make up like three of them. This isn't an issue inherently, if done right it can be great. The problem here is that this isn't always done well. Some levels take advantage of this pretty smartly, either due to the original levels already being really good, or just making sense when mixed with other levels or original ideas that the devs had for this game, but others just don't flow well with Sonic's controls. It's both a case of good nostalgia, where it makes sense to grab ideas from what worked in the past, but of lazy designing as well, as I would have liked to see more original levels here, even though they still flow and feel very good to play for the most part, it's just this recycling of levels that leaves a bad taste in my mouth. This becomes even more evident when speedrunning the game, which is really fun by the way. Speedrunning is always a big trend in Sonic games, as that's the nature of the games, but not always is it fun or notable to mention, though here it is, very much. The main speedrunning mechanic is this ability that has like a billion names, where if you use the homing attack on an object, and then press the boost button to counter it, you will gain ridiculous amounts of speed, which will help you skip really big parts of the level. This would normally be sort of whatever, but the way the levels are designed work very well with this mechanic for some reason. It almost feels like it was on purpose when it most certainly wasn't. The fact that the levels are oftentimes really open lets you use this ability to your advantage, and create some pretty fun and quick runs of your own, making the most out of the multiple paths and routes that the stages have to offer. Oh wait, I haven't mentioned that, have I? Though the stages are simpler most of the time, they actually have some alternate routes and paths for you to take. This doesn't go for all levels, as smaller ones do still have alternate routes, but they are not very fleshed out. These paths usually consist of the main path and two or three branching paths, as you're already sick of hearing, with some containing a collectible in the form of red star rings. But they are finally given more meaning now, as opposed to just being a faster route or one with a worthless collectible, as the red star rings 
rings do play a big part in obtaining vault keys, which are mandatory to progress in the story, thus adding more depth to the system. Spectacle is also present, usually through the form of gimmicks that you don't really have control of, camera angles, set pieces where there's something special happening like pillars crumbling, and curiously, by the way the gameplay feels too. I'm specifically referring to the floatier objects, like the balloons, the rails and trails of rings where you can use the light speed dash. Though quick decision making is required, it still allows you to take in the scenery while still feeling very fluid and satisfactory, and are used in such a way that make you feel really cool when you're playing, which equals good. As a sort of final thought section, I do want to stress that a lot of these stages do feel like tests for gameplay styles and gimmicks, which is corroborated by the divergent quality between the levels, but it's good that Sonic Team is actually trying this stuff and actually getting a lot of them right, so they know what will work next time. Concluding Sonic Frontiers, I do think that the level design is very solid, flows and plays well, even though it feels weird at first after playing Unleashed and all of those. Some stages are pretty hit or miss, which is to be expected given the heavy tweak in Sonic's gameplay style, but it's generally pretty good, not gonna lie. The levels look great, selling that virtual reality space environment. I do think that only existing for level themes, one original and three reused, is pretty shit, though I'm happy they used Sky Sanctuary this time. They are really pretty, looking incredible in different times of day and just feel grandiose most of the time, giving a good sensation of discovery and atmosphere. And with all of that, how has the level design changed in this era? What mostly marks this era on the negative side is automation. We start with Unleashed, where automation was plentiful, though not very intrusive, I'd say. There were some glaring issues that needed to be fixed in the next title, in the form of Sonic Colors. Colors didn't really fix what needed to be fixed. It rather implemented multiple workarounds to prevent this from being too noticeable, such as the introduction of the Wisps and the limited use of the boost, which does in part result in less automation, but it doesn't really apply to a game with a playstyle of Unleashed. And that is when Generation steps up. It does feature some automation still, but it's mostly used for spectacle, being even less intrusive and is smartly used to aid in gameplay somewhat. Then Forces comes around and fucks everything up. It's an almost fully automated game, with boost pads and springs that always correct your direction or send you where the game wants you to go. The boost just plows and melts through enemies and obstacles like a hot knife, it doesn't make any sense. That's where Frontiers comes around and cuts the issue by the root, changing how the boost behaves. It's slower, doesn't make Sonic invincible, doesn't destroy enemies, it's rather treated as a sort of run button. This in turn forces the levels to be designed in a different way, as the old style doesn't really work anymore, being built with some philosophies taken from the adventures, while still retaining the the aspects that mark the boost gameplay. What they are though is not always crystal clear. For example, Unleashed sort of introduces the basis of the boost playstyle. Lightning fast gameplay, mixing 3D sections where your goal is to go as fast as possible, while destroying enemies to keep your boost gauge full and also avoiding obstacles, and 2D sections where you have to conjugate speed with platforming and quick decision making. All of this requiring a supreme use of Sonic's moveset set, while also adding spectacle and a pinch of exploration. It still had problems such as automation, a linear and simpler philosophy when it comes to levels, which is debatable here, and controls to some degree. Sonic Colors keeps the Unleashed gameplay mostly intact, except for the parts where it doesn't. Sonic has a double jump now, as well as being slower and having less boost, thus the stages are more focused on platforming and exploration, to the point that it almost reminds you of Sonic CD. There are more gimmicks, such as the Wisps, which allowed for numerous new segments, ideas and playstyles never implemented in a Sonic game. Spectacle is taken up a notch, as sadly are scripted sequences and automation, but still creating some pretty well designed and engaging levels. You can see how these two differ a lot while still having the same core ideas. The boost gameplay is still mostly intact, thus the way the levels are built are still pretty similar because they have to account 
around with this same mechanic. They can't be overly platformy, or have a lot of combat sections, or be open like SA1. So, even when the games are too ambitious with its mechanics and gimmicks, and level design does change a lot because of them, at their core, they follow the same philosophy, always. Be it in these two generations, which improves on both, or even forces. What mostly differs between them are the way Sonic controls and the abilities that he has, where the differences will usually become more evident. Forces' level design might be miles worse than what was seen in Generations, but when you think about it, they are built with the same philosophy in mind, boost gameplay. Sure, the boost works a little bit differently in these two, as do Sonic's controls, but the biggest factor that separates them is execution, and how inspired the devs were were and also the time they were given. Frontiers is living proof that, even with the same concept in mind, the same level layouts can be played in different manners, considering that this mechanic is utilized to different degrees, while still tweaking the mechanic itself and keeping its core identity mostly intact. Which iteration of this mechanic is the best though is up to each one of us to decide, as it's important to share ideas and also opposite opinions. With this in mind, what makes for good level design in a Sonic game? The answer depends on the type of gameplay and player mostly, and even then the answer is somewhat uncertain. For the classics, people usually appreciate momentum-based gameplay. Sonic always has a speed cap in those games that can only be broken by going on a downhill. This speed can then be utilized to blaze through the levels at high speed, passing through loops and slopes and landing on higher platforms, thus on higher and faster paths of the the level. The paths in specific should be thoroughly fleshed out, having a challenge and a purpose, branching from a point then converging at another, or leading to a specific area that no other route has access to, thus giving them more meaning than just their mere existence. These games should seek to reward the player for learning how to master the level design, and to keep their speed, be it by, as I've said, granting them access to faster or alternate paths, item boxes or just plain fun, which goes for all eras. They have to flow well, play well, be interesting to explore and satisfying to platform, while adding speed and fun gimmicks into the mix. For the adventure style games, this starts to get more complicated. Personally, I like not to overcomplicate. What do I mean by this, you ask? I mean that the games should have stick to what made them good in the first place. At their core, they all did honestly, which is good. But some add stuff into the mix which is passable at best. Usually, the games in this era are characterized by some pretty basic concepts. More open levels, more free movement, a balance between speed and platforming, with some but not many exploration segments, some alternate paths which are usually accessible with the help of gimmicks, frequently forcing the player to make decisions really quickly. And, above all, fluid gameplay and very similar elements to that of the classics, but in 3D. The games that follow this the most are SA1 and SA2, though SA2 does start to distance itself from some of these concepts, especially with the introduction of new playstyles and more linear levels, but the basic philosophy from SA1 would be revisited in 06, which is a mix of influences from both adventures. Heroes is similar to some degree, but its level design is also really different and unique because of its main mechanic, forcing the player into decision-making almost constantly, which does add depth to the gameplay and more meaning to the stages. It does make some mistakes though. This system is not explored to the point where it actually feels organic, some design choices are questionable, and repeating the same stages four times is horrible. But, at the end of the day, when you go and analyze its level design, it's still built with the same thing in mind as SA1 and SA2 were and that is the main philosophy of these games, which would be followed even more closely by 06, as I've said, expanding on what SA1 did while still taking some improvements from SA2 and Heroes. And Lost Worlds doesn't really fit in any section. Some people prefer when the games follow more closely the recipe from SA1, others from SA2, but at the end of the day, there is no denying that they complement each other. Lastly, for the boost games, this gets even more complicated, 
complicated, not in actually analyzing what the main philosophy is, but a divergence in opinions within the fanbase itself. Some people prefer the Unleashed style, that being Sonic feeling faster with less alternate paths, quicker 2D sections, quick time events, being less focused on platforming and exploration than its successors. Overall, quick and fluid gameplay and levels. Others prefer what was seen in Colors, less actual boosting, more platforming and exploration, multiple branching paths, sometimes, more puzzling, which is usually helped by gimmicks and the wisps, which change things up from time to time, and more spectacle and scripted sequences. Others will say that Generations was the peak of the boost gameplay, refining the concepts seen in Unleashed without getting rid of them, that being the speed, the fluidness and less 2D sections, while also taking the good parts from colors and adapting them to an Unleashed playstyle, those being refining the platforming and exploration, not only by changing how Sonic controls, but by adapting these sections according to that, adding spectacle without it being very automated, introducing gimmicks that are more fleshed out and fun to play, investing more on the multiple paths and routes by making them more alive with stuff actually going on of value, while still being a very speedy and fluid game to play. I'm not even gonna say that others prefer forces, because I really doubt those people exist, but there are definitely some more radical people that will say that the boost gameplay has to change in its score if it's ever gonna be done right, which was what Frontiers did. The boost doesn't kill enemies, it's slower, Sonic controls much like the adventures, and much of the level design is actually taken from previous games. The game gives alternate routes a new meaning, and focuses more heavily on the trick system and speedrunning aspect, while still being slower but still being very fluid. Even though the boost games went through a lot of phases, they still follow the same base philosophy once again. Quick and fluid gameplay, more linear level design with some variety of paths to take, with more obstacles in 2D sections, of which the 3D are more focused in the going fast aspects, more set pieces where spectacle is prevalent, the presence of level specific gimmicks and mechanics to change things up to prevent the game from feeling monotonous, and usually a very alive though often simple level design. Even with all of this, you just have to accept that level design isn't everything. It's very important, no doubt, but maybe it isn't as big of a deal breaker as people think it is. Personally, for the sake of getting my point across, I'm gonna say my top 5 Sonic games of all time. 5th is CD, 4th is Mania, 3rd is Generation, 2nd is Adventure 1, and 1st is Heroes. None of them are perfect, and you can see that I, personally, enjoy games from all eras. It's not like you're obliged to enjoy more a certain era or a certain playstyle. Sure, I have more games from the Adventure era than the Boost era, and those from the Classic era are the bottom ranked, but realistically, there is no big difference in enjoyment between the rankings. I do still enjoy a lot of games from those eras, such as Sonic 2, Unleashed and Adventure 2. I also really praised the level design from my bottom 4 picks, but really didn't do so with my top pick, being Heroes. And that is what I mean by level design not being everything, because, at the end of the day, even if the level design in a game isn't that good when you analyze it, so what? I'm not the one who's gonna keep myself from enjoying it, and that is why I do also feel that what makes for good level design isn't always certain. It's more accurate to come to a conclusion to what you don't like, as it's often more evident than what you do enjoy or don't feel strongly about, which are probably more things. And there is also the fact that there's more to a game than their level such as the story, the visuals, the soundtrack, the gameplay, the narrative, the atmosphere, there is a lot of important stuff. And most importantly for me, there's the sentimental factor. I think what matters most is what we feel about each game, the value it has and what it means to us. They are often associated with certain times of our lives, and thus we associate them with how they have had an impact on us, be it by helping us go through a tough time or being the game of our childhood. And that's what I want to transmit mostly. It was fun analyzing the evolution of the level designs, why and how they have evolved, by influence of what and who, but realistically, it doesn't really matter much, does it? Praise what has to be praised and criticize what has to be criticized, but there is a lot more value in stuff that you deem as bad than you think there is.
And that's all I have for this episode. I hope you could still enjoy it, even if you didn't agree with some of the points I made. Or if you thought my analysis wasn't good enough, but I'm always open to improve. I would seriously like to read about what you think makes for good level designs in Sonic games, and what levels you think are the best designed, and would also like to see if I missed something that you thought I should have covered or talked about. I also have a Patreon, where you can support me for very cheap, and a Twitter if you want to follow me there, both links are in the description. I would also really appreciate if you subscribe if you enjoy my content, as it does really help me out a ton. And that's about it really, I'll hopefully see you soon.